Check the new chair. Good evening, folks. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the September 27th meeting of the Northampton Planning Board. Um, we have two items on our agenda tonight, the first scheduled for 7 p.m., the second scheduled for 7.40. We always start our meetings opening up uh, the floor for public comment regarding anything that is not on our agenda. So if anyone is here and would like to uh, make pub public comment, please come up to the podium, tell us your name and your address, and please don't be shy. And if there's no unrelated comment, we'll go to our 7 p.m. hearing, which is a continuation of a request by Benjamin Lewis for site plan and special permit to demolish an existing office building and four family house to construct 12 townhouse units at 236 uh, South Street slash 3 Olive Street, Northampton map ID is 38B, 245 and 246. Uh, before we start, I just want to give you a little bit of a reminder or an overview. This is a continuation of a hearing, so that means we should um, act as if we all just went to sleep for a few weeks and have woken up and we're back in our same hearing. Um, I will do a quick recap of some of the issues or the issues that were raised in the previous hearing. Uh, we would ask that, again, because this is a continuation, that folks are raising issues or making comments about new items that have not yet been brought to the board or have not yet been submitted. Um, we have received a number of comments via email um, or by letter that have been provided to us by Carolyn that are in the public record already. Um, so just a very kind of quick overview of the things that we have already discussed with regard to the, the prior set of plans that were submitted for the last meeting. Um, we did hear from folks regarding um, the idea that there is not enough parking or not enough space to turn around in the existing site, that there are too many housing units, that the design of the housing units don't fit into the neighborhood, that there is speeding on Olive and South Street, that there will be additional trips on Olive Street, that there will be impact to trees off of the property that's being developed, that there are stormwater issues, and that there is a shed on the property line. Some new information has been provided to us in the form of updated plans, as well as an arborist's report. Um, we are still waiting on updated stormwater calculations uh, and some additional information that's been requested by DPW. So just so everyone understands that we won't be able to make it a, a decision on this project without that information. So we will be continuing the hearing until we get updated stormwater information um, and we understand some updated site information. So with that, if anyone else has any other comments they want to make? Uh, because of the nature of my work, I've had occasion to work with uh, Jeff from Berkshire Design uh, in the past. Um, I don't believe that uh, prevents me from being objective, but if anybody in the audience thinks differently, you can raise your hand and I can recuse myself. <laughs> that was she a doesn't <laughs> This is a psych. <laughs> <laughs> What's the nature of your relationship? I'm a commercial contractor and, and we've worked with uh, Berkshire Design in the past. But no current relationship with regard to this particular Correct. project at this site. Correct. Um, so because this is a continuation, do we begin with another presentation from the applicant? Or? Well, you have new information, so right. it makes, makes okay. sense to have a presentation of the new information. So what has been provided are new, uh, is a new site layout, again, the Arborist Report and a number of other plans. So we'd love to hear a presentation about that. Pardon me in advance for looking down a lot, but I had a lot that I felt like I wanted to respond to, so I wanted to try and gather my thoughts in advance. Hi and good evening. My name is Ben, and I'm the developer working on the project at 236 South Street. I'd like to begin by apologizing. I think we got off on the wrong foot, and that was certainly not my intention. As you know, I was out of the country with my family on a previously scheduled trip at the time of the planning board meeting. Since he had worked on the many technical aspects of the project, I asked Jeff Squire from Berkshire Design to present at that meeting. I was under the impression that this was frequently done and regret that my absence was seen as ignoring the neighbor's concerns or was disrespectful to you in any way. As I hope you will come to find out and the many people who have worked with me in the past can attest, I pride myself on being compassionate and rational and the last thing I would ever want to do is be disrespectful. With that, I'm sorry. To recap quickly at the August 9th meeting, there were a number of issues that were raised both by concerned neighbors as well as the members of the board. In short, those issues were as follows. The maple trees on the neighbor's property at 11 Olive Street. 
that there were too many units and the units are too large. There were concerns about traffic flow, overflow parking spilling out onto Olive and the surrounding streets. And the final concern was that the building doesn't fit into the neighborhood and presents as too large on the street corner. The first issue we addressed was regarding the Meltzer Lapines maple trees. After speaking directly with Amy and Keith, we brought out an arborist to examine the trees and our site plans, and ultimately provided us with a report indicating an endorsement of the project with particular recommendations to heed during construction so as to allay any worries about impact on neighboring trees. Additionally, in speaking, excuse me, Speaking with David from Urban Forestry Solutions, we found out that if we turned our proposed parking lot and made a few modifications, we would be able to save a third maple tree, this one from our lot, in addition to the two maple trees on the Meltzer Lapine property, as well as a tree belonging to Ms. Per Pergantides from 28 Ravel Ave. The second issue was that there were too many units and that they would bring too many people to the neighborhood. This was a concern that was mentioned at the August 9th meeting and again when I met with the neighborhood at the beginning of September. When I sat with the neighbors, I was really trying to get a sense of their main concerns so that I could address them. Some spoke, of, some spoke of overflow parking crowding the street, and others worried about the safety of pedestrians as F-250s ripped down the street on the way to the Oxbow. Others expressed concerns with additional traffic from UPS or other delivery trucks, particularly because they park on the wrong side of the street and didn't like the idea that there were going to be more people living in the neighborhood. At this point, I felt it was on me to do a little research. I'm sure you know them well, but I wanted to review Northampton's guidelines for infill for myself, and more importantly, the rationale behind the guidelines. One of the goals set forth as part of the 2013 changes was to design energy efficient housing with smaller units more smartly designed. Half of our units are under 1,000 square feet and will perfectly suit an individual, couple, small family, or roommates. The other half of our units are designed to bring families and friends choosing to live together for economic, social, or a multitude of other reasons within a 15-minute stroll down South Street to the center of Northampton. There are very few places around Northampton where a family looking to be within walking distance of town can still have all the benefits of new construction and green living. Northampton has a housing shortage, and from a development perspective, we are proud to bring units with just the right amount of space to South and Olive the gateway to one of the cherished neighborhoods in Northampton. The first objective in the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan is to, and I quote, ask for creative designs and cluster development that allow higher density to build high and medium density housing of 12 to 65 units per acre. As a means of comparison and to help frame our project within others in Northampton, our pro project is seeking to build 12 units on 0.71 acres, roughly 17 units per acre comparable with Cherry Street and Fruit Street as compared with Graves Avenue and New, and New South Street, each, uh, with, each with roughly 19 and 20 units respectively, or the much larger complexes on Conn Street and New South Street. The project at 227 South Street, Caddy Corner from the location of this site, was just approved for eight units on about half an acre, much of which is wooded and undevelopable, roughly 16 units per acre. This is one of the areas where we're most proud maximizing two underused parcels and reconditioning the area into desirable residences, answering objective number five from the comprehensive plan of focusing new development within walking distances along safe paths or with bicycle access to and from neighborhood commercial areas, parks and recreation, schools and public transportation. I understand that Northampton has guidelines for infill and while a special permit is required for larger projects, the guidelines that were established were put in place for a reason. So we have worked hard to follow those suggestions and maximize the space. We could have chosen to put in eight units or 10 units or smaller units, but after much deliberation, it simply didn't make sense to me. Part of it was a financial decision, and I believe I have a responsibility to develop a project that can sustain itself, not one that operates on margins too thin that jeopardize its long-term viability. More importantly though, to take a project like this which will bring rental housing within walking distance to downtown, an area in which Northampton is desperately lacking, and reduce the unit size because some of the neighbors have expressed concerns about overflow parking, it didn't make sense to me and seems antithetical to the concept of infill. Again, I didn't just want to trust my gut or treat the neighbors' opinions as gospel. I wanted to do my due diligence. At the neighborhood meeting, I promised them that I would look into these issues. As landlords in a few different locations around town, we pride ourselves on being good neighbors and adding more to the neighborhood than we take from it. We have welcomed the planting of trees by the tree committee, and on numerous occasions, we have shoveled snow from neighbors' snowy walkways and driveways and taken care of lawns full of leaves just to help out. 
If parking was really going to be an issue, I wanted to know about it so that we could do what was necessary to remedy it. But I was trying to separate perception from reality. The neighbors expressed two related concerns. Parking spill over onto Olive Street and the traffic flow now that there will only be one entrance and exit and that it will be on Olive. As for traffic flow, in short, if someone pulls into the lot in error, they will be able to turn around either in the striped space next to the handicap spot or in one of the newly located visitor spaces. In our first meeting with city officials in January, they asked us to move the driveway off South Street onto Olive. They felt that this would benefit both our future residents and the general population, since exiting at the stop sign at the corner would be safer, regardless of if the driver were heading toward Northampton or out toward East Hampton. Again, in an effort to pursue as many different options as possible with the goal of finding the one that best met the needs of the various stakeholders associated with the project, we even explored an alternate path with a circuitous driveway weaving from South Street behind our buildings and out onto Olive. In the efforts of protecting the neighbor's trees, and since it would have provided us with fewer parking spots than either our original parking lot design or the design we present to you tonight, we didn't feel that this was a viable option. With regards to the concern about parking spillover onto Olive, I reached out to both the parking department and the police department. I found out that in the past three years, parking enforcement has given out two tickets on Ravel and no tickets on Olive or Fairview. The Northampton Police Department has given out six citations and has been called 14 times in the past three years on these three streets due to parking enforcement. I was fortunate to run into Emmy from the parking department who happened to be in the police department when I was making my inquiries. In talking with her, she said that the parking department does not consider Olive to be a troublesome street. She said that there are typically three to four cars parked on Olive at any time of day or night, which, which confirmed what I had found on more than a dozen trips to the neighborhood at times ranging from midnight to 5.45 a.m. to 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Again, wanting to confirm to the best of our abilities that parking wouldn't be a problem, we asked Berkshire Design to do a parking spot analysis of Olive Street where they identified 26 spots on Olive Street alone. Nancy and the parking department made the recommendation that if there are spots where parking or backing out is particularly tough, the neighborhood could petition to have a space marked as a no parking zone. The parking department did say that Olive Street is like many streets here in Northampton in that in a snow emergency, the street gets tight. But according to them, it's not as bad as many of Northampton's streets. With all of that said, we understand that the city encourages on-street parking using existing infrastructure and that we don't need additional parking beyond the 18 plus one handicap accessible spot. And while we are making every effort to have this project be as environmentally considered as possible and not paving unnecessarily, given the neighborhood concerns, we felt that adding additional guest parking spaces was beneficial, both for our future residents and to put at ease some of our neighbors' concerns. In trying to think as broadly as possible to prevent future parking challenges, I've even reached out to Valley Bike on three separate occasions to discuss putting a bike station at this corner, further encouraging future residents as well as others in the South Street community to use bikes when feasible. I understand that some of the animosity directed toward this project has a base in losing the street parking a few years ago from South Street when the bike lane was introduced. While this may have seemed significant at the time, Presently, it doesn't seem to prevent anyone from parking on Olive at any time of day or night. I'd like to remind everyone about that tonight as there are many feelings of worry about what might become of Olive Street parking. If anything, the residences we're proposing make use of Northampton's continued efforts on sustainability, located along a street with a bike lane just across the street from a bus stop. The final concern was that the building doesn't fit into the neighborhood and presents as too large on the street corner. This was not mentioned as a concern at the neighbor's meeting. And when I asked about it directly, one of the neighbors even said, the architecture is the only thing I like about this project. With that said, it is my understanding that some members of the planning board had some concerns about the architecture fitting in with the neighborhood. So we reduced the massing, tightening up the unit's square footage where necessary, and beautified the corner unit, drawing in complementary elements from the neighborhood. All of this has been done while maintaining the utmost respect for our immediate neighbors and a six foot privacy fence with appropriate internal landscaping to soften the wood fencing has been designed. What had been two buildings is now being shown as one cohesive building with private covered entrances stepped forward and backward to preserve the neighborhood aesthetic. As citizens and communities are recognizing the renewed importance of living in smaller, more compressed space, examples of townhouses that make the best use of infill <laughs> space in this way are becoming more and more common around the country and help maintain a neighborhood look and feel while maximizing the available lot 
in accordance with infill best practices. I would like to pause to thank the Historical Commission who helped us explicitly craft a green townhouse development that fits into the Cherish South Street neighborhood. You'll notice among other elements on the street facing side, partial eave returns, a nod to the current multifamily home at 236 South Street. Additionally, appropriate windows and doors combined with a historical color palette were all specifically chosen to ensure that the new development at the corner of South and Olive can serve both as a showpiece and entrance to the South Street neighborhood and blend in with the existing streetscape. All of this was done facing out to South and Olive, while the interior courtyard is designed as a modern oasis, complete with rooftop solar to ensure that our future residents have the best of what's available and are able to live as green a life as they choose. Additionally, we are working with two local green energy providers, Beyond Green from East Hampton and PV Squared in Greenfield, to maximize our energy efficiency. As you can see, we have tried to be deliberate and thoughtful throughout this project, <coughs> from its nascent stages in, in January to what you see before you tonight. We have heavily researched local and national trends and believe deeply that now, with car ownership and ho home ownership rates on the de decline, by bringing the consumer what she desires, energy efficient, elegantly designed homes that are just the right size within walking distance of downtown, we will be able to do our small part in beautifying and improving Northampton for the next 50 years. In response to the report Urban Forestry Solutions detailed, our neighbor hired a landscape architect to provide a second opinion. In his report, which Amy Meltzer submitted on Tuesday, he recommends moving the parking lot 10 feet from the property boundary in order to best preserve the trees. In wanting to respect Amy and Keith's trees and do absolutely everything we can to ensure their safety, we would like you to consider the proposal we've set before you tonight with the understanding that we are going to move the parking lot 10 feet off the property boundary. We realize that this may cause us to reduce our project by one unit and are prepared to do so for the benefit of the neighbors and the trees. When the neighbors were asking us to reduce the unit size because of parking, we examined that and found that Olive Street only had 20% of its street parking used. When the neighbors were asking us to reduce the unit size because they didn't want so many people moving to the neighborhood, this struck me as elitist and disturbed me and re represents an opposing view to what I believe the city of Northampton desires and needs more diverse housing options for more people moving to town. When the neighbors asked us to reduce the unit size because of a perception that their property values would plummet and their oh, nest eggs would thanks. be lost, we reviewed trends nationally and found that not to be the case. We looked here too and infill housing has not caused home prices to suffer. The entire Northampton market has risen approximately 3% in the past 12 months and homes near infill projects have risen in kind. Now, when the neighbors are asking us to move the parking lot 10 feet to ensure the safety of their trees, combined with DPW's recommendations, we are happy to do so. It makes sense. We just received this information in the last 72 hours and have been working on modifications to the plan we submitted in advance of tonight's meeting. We hope to be prepared to have a revised site plan next week, but I'm asking for your help tonight. In speaking with DPW, they have made clear that they will not review plans until the design and site plan are finalized. Despite making numerous changes since the last meeting, we're not able to hit a constantly moving target. And so I'm asking you to help by approving these plans tonight in concept with the understanding that there will be a new driveway away from the trees and a reduction in units so that we can revise them in accordance with this new information in time for next month's meeting. Putting together a development of this size is no small undertaking and I recognize that there are many often competing desires. Thank you very much for your feedback in August, the time you have put into that meeting and tonight's meeting, and your willingness to help ensure that the future of Northampton is sustainable and meets the needs and desires of current and future residents. Thank you very much. At this stage, typically the board will ask questions of the applicant if we've got some technical questions, and then we'll open it up. So we may come back and continue to ask you questions, but I want to just ask other board members if you've got anything you'd like to, to ask straight away regarding the technical merits of the project. Um, ben, can you or Jeff conceptually walk us through how that parking lot is going to move in its configuration 10 feet or is it going to be totally reconfigured? In uh, 10 feet? So, um, again, we've really just been w w looking at this in the last two days, mm -hmm. but what we're talking about doing and either Jeff or John. John Landry is our architect. Um, what we're talking about doing is eliminating this end unit, 
shifting all of this so that it's 10 feet off the boundary. And if possible, putting this smaller unit back up here. What do you mean, if, if possible? I mean, so I mean, you might eliminate two units? It's possible that we, if ideally we don't have to do it, and we're hoping that the parking, that we receive enough parking spaces um, to do it. But because of the bit, a bit of it is still ambiguous and wanting to work with DPW, we're, pre we're prepared to, um, to, to do what's necessary to move this over. But a reduction in units just for a reduction in units sake didn't, didn't really make sense to us. So in the last meeting, one of the things we asked for was, as we've asked other previous developers, is sort of a model of how this would look relative sure. to the other thing. So um, this, this bottom view, everyone can see, is uh, an, the newly designed corner. And you'll see this White House is, the, is Courtney Hill's house, the house next door to us. And then this driveway down here is, where, is leading to $11. If you also asked for an aerial perspective, and so this is, this gives you a sense of, uh, of the aerial perspective. Uh, we have shown carports here. Our, our desire is to keep carports, uh, both for the, for the residents' cars benefit, but also ideally we'd be able to put additional solar units on that. Um, depending on, depending on the rest of the site, th that's sort of one of the things that we would be willing to give up if we if we needed to. But um, our hope is to be able to provide those carports. <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Taylor, was there something specific that you wanted? No, 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 it was relative to what we had asked for. So, so I, just to understand, you're getting rid of the larger unit on the other side? Uh-huh. Is that what you're doing? On that unit on the top, so the right, this, this right one, corner, uh, the right corner? Must, yep, this and one. You're getting rid of that and moving one to that spot? So you're getting rid of the lar one large unit? Yeah. Okay. And then all of that parking that's at the top would just shift this, yeah, we would pull every, you know, 10 feet off the line in accordance with the suggestions and then move it over, you know. But not the lower portion, not the, the portion that's right at the bottom? Here? Yeah, those spaces would stay. Uh, everything would be, would be pulled off as long as it's everything. not, uh, as long as it's, you know, in, in line with where the trees are. I mean, okay. you know, that, that's our... Okay. You, if you drop a unit, you would the, the bigger unit wouldn't. Um, you'd be able to drop two parking spaces as well. Is that what the intention is? And again, you know, we, we sort of like the idea of having one or two visitor spaces as long as it as long as it fits, and we sort of felt like that that's within the realm of reasonable. Not paving too much and not uh, not make, stressing the neighborhood or stressing the residents' mm -hmm. uh, ongoing lives. Other comments from the board before we open it up? So, so it, I'm sorry if I kind of a little behind, but it's one park per unit? There's a one parking space for the small units and two parking spaces for the larger units, plus one handicap space plus the stripe. So in the current design, it had it, it, it required 18, unit, 18 spaces plus one, and in that design, we had 20 plus one. And our hope is that you know, w if we're dropping one unit, we'll, our number will drop to 16, but hopefully we'll still be able to get an 18. So um, I just wanted to clarify about the exterior sidewalks on South and Olive. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the demo plan, it says sidewalks to stay, but on another plan, you're redoing all the sidewalks in concrete? Yeah. Okay. They'll all be new, yeah. So there's just a little conflict there, the two. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. something else George the only uh, the only other one and, and I'm not sure where I I know where I stand on it but um, I think the plans show the some of the uh, AC units um, are going to be proposed on the front on South Street at the front of the houses at ground level is it possible to remove those and get them into the back courtyard so I don't think that's perhaps a look that we want on Main uh, Street and you can't really hide them with bushes 
I think that the the landscaping is is designed to hide them, um, and because the the courtyard is where the main entrance is really going to be for, you know, on a day to day basis for the residents, we felt that it made sense to put them on the on the other side, because they would still be hidden from the street. Okay, all right, because to my understanding of the, the AC world. They really don't want any shrubs or anything in front of those condensing units? The, I'm sorry, there, um, it, it's a little hard to see, but the, sh in the AC units will be underneath um, uh, an overhang, and then, I'm not sure exactly, maybe three, two feet, three feet, and then in front of that would be where the shrubbery is. So there, there, there would be a place to walk by the unit okay. between where the unit is and where the landscaping okay. begins. Motion to open up public comment. Mark, a second. Front Krista, all those in favor? Oh, it's okay. okay. Uh, so we're happy to hear from the public now. Thank you for sure. your presentation. It's helpful to to have this new information. And I think the project is already evolving. Um, so if we do have members of the public who'd like to speak again, just a reminder that we'd like to try to. Recall that we have heard a lot of comments on the prior set of plans, so we'd like to uh, be as efficient as possible and hear new information from folks. Thanks. X this out. I should X this out. Uh, I think uh, so. Can I leave it just in case we need yeah. to refer yeah. back yeah. to it? Okay. I didn't know if anybody else needed. Hi, everybody. Gina Louise Shara, 145 State Street. I am the Ward 4 City Councilor, uh, City Council Vice President, and Vice Chair of Transportation and Parking. Those are sort of my relevant titles for this. Um, I am going to keep in mind that we are continuing and not go over old ground as much as possible. I just want to say that I'm, I'm continue, I continue to be a little bit concerned about the cars turning around um, or, or not being able to turn around and illegally backing out. Um, I, I understand that this is now being reconfigured, so I'll, I'll look forward to seeing the new design, but i just like that to be kept in mind. Um, because if the what are the visitor spots are full, even with these two new spots, if they're full, um, those that hatch space next to a um, handicap parking spot isn't really meant to be a turnaround. It has another purpose, which is to um, have space for a wheelchair. And so that's um, it, it. Would be better if there was a dedicated space for being able to turn around instead of using that. Um, and again, I just want to give my opinion that as someone who spends a lot of time talking about traffic calming and mitigation and the significant real world costs of that, um, the payment in lieu of, um, of improvements of around $4,000, which is based on the formula of 1000 per additional projected peak, um, doesn't really accurately reflect the impact and, um, and would be pretty small for a project this size. So there's a reason that payments in lieu of actual improvements are chosen and that's because they are likely to be less costly than the actual improvements. And so um, it doesn't mean that they actually reflect the cost of the impact. And I just like to keep that in mind because that money is very important for Northampton, even if it's not used in this area to do traffic mitigation elsewhere. Um, so thank you. So just a quick clarification. The, the payment in lieu formula, though, is based on, you know, I mean, we don't have control over what guides I that totally formula. I totally understand so, that. Yeah, but is yeah, that something my that is maybe with the formula? Right. So, but, can, is that something the city council can address? I mean, can you have add another layer to that formula that I, says use this formula instead? Carolyn, can you answer one? <laughs> or is it a formula that's? Well, no. I mean, we've done a lot of internal research about how to figure out those costs, and it's really about incremental costs. It's not that you can do a project based on a new development. It's what that incremental impact is based on the number of trips generated from a project right. and try to sort of, you know, if an intersection change costs a million dollars, what do, you know, four or five additional units do? What's their contributing impact to that or that trigger then um, requires that $1 million change? So, oh, um, although I'm sure that, um, um, people could argue on both sides that it's too much or too little. Um, I think it's the best number based on the calculations of projects that we've done and sort of looking at the total number of trips generated. Mm -hmm. um, and we use the for, ITV 
standard, is that right? Um, a plus informed um, project impacts that we know about that have happened in Northampton. So, um, yeah, and the other piece of it is we use that as the value as well. So even if um, someone opted to do a project, so build a new sidewalk or a crosswalk, it still would be based on the same level of impact. So it wouldn't be, um, uh, if a crosswalk costs, you know, $20,000 to um, construct, but the formula states that the applicant only is required to pay 10,000, even if they offered to build it, they would only be able to build half a crosswalk <laughs> instead. Right. I mean, because we can't require more, va you know, value for the, for construction versus the amount of money that's paid into the, um, so I think it makes sense that over time we go back and r look at those um, projects, costs and project mm -hmm. impacts um, for um, uh, development that occurs. Um, but I think, e you know, we try to base it somewhat on what we feel is the, um, reality. We haven't addressed it in, I don't know what, what it is, five or seven years, but, yeah. Okay. That's Thank you. And just remember to tell us your name and your address when you come to the podium. Hi, I'm Cheryl Musio, and I live at 58 Fort Street. And um, with all the concern, I wanna, first I want to say that there's a lot about this project that I really like. And I think there's some really good ideas. My concern is the scope of it. Uh, primarily, I know there's concerns about parking and this and that, but mine is about traffic. Now, I understand that the board doesn't want anything to go out onto South Street because we all know in commuting time, we don't need another uh, street feeding into South Street. And um, so my concern is that people are gonna go down uh, Olive Street and onto Fort. The lower part of um, Olive and Fort uh, are both hills. There's no sidewalks. They're relatively narrow. And you know, you can make a joke kind of about F-150s coming down um, Olive Street, but believe me, it, it, it was a quote, it wasn't a joke. Okay, but, and it was a quote because it happens. I'm sure. I'm sure. And so I think certainly I've, it's, it's an area a lot of pedestrians use. People walk their dogs, people take walks, because it goes into the meadows. And I can't count the number of times when I've had to jump off the street and onto you know, my lawn or someone else's lawn in order to feel safe. And so adding this number of cars, I mean, if we're talking about 18 spaces, 20 spaces, it just, it, it seems to me that there's, it, there's a pedestrian safety issue that um, I hope you all will consider. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I brought some visuals, so I'm gonna <coughs> just state your name. I'm Amy Meltzer. Did you just tell me to do that? <laughs> I'm Amy Meltzer, and I live at 11 Olive Street. Um, sorry, I just need to figure out Um, so I, I want to just speak to the new plans and to the, the, the concerns about my own trees and maybe respond to only anything that's new. I, I just want to take great umbrage to the insinuation that people in our neighborhood are elitist for not wanting this. And I, I just want to rattle off, not to be a name dropper, but if I say the names of people who've expressed concern while supporting infill to this project, Joel Feldman. Pam Schwartz, Lily Lombard, Dorothy Nemitz. These are people who care deeply about everyone in our community. And so to suggest that those of us who are, uh, have concerns about this project is coming from a place of elitism, especially when half the units are larger than most of our houses, it just it doesn't ring true and it feels insulting. Um, the reason that I, I engaged the landscape architect, you know, everything has really throughout the throughout the history of this project coming kind of at the last minute, and it's felt like it's really hard and hard. Like this, our understanding was that these plans were due on Thursday. 
they came in Friday. I don't want to quibble about a day, but for those of us who are not professionals, it takes a long time to prepare and to learn what we need to know to understand. And I already enumerated a lot of things that we caught in earlier plans, and I won't go through them again, but only to say that I felt that my vigilance about something I cared deeply about was warranted. So I did hire a landscape architect from our <laughs> synagogue to review the plans with me. Um, and I just want to share some illustrations. I know that you already saw his letter. I'm sorry, I also want to clarify just something that, that Ben said, and I'm so grateful to hear about the project being moved a minimum of 10 feet away from my property, <coughs> because that's been as a butter my greatest concern. But I do want to clarify that the recommendation in the landscape, in my landscape architects was at a minimum, I recommend edge of pavement be set back 10 feet Further site investigation should be required and might indicate that affected tree roots extend further west, suggesting a larger buffer requirement. I bring that up only to say, I just want to implore you not to, I, I can't imagine that you would approve uh, on good faith, but I'm just going to really implore you not to imp approve the new plans until we actually see them and that we can review them again with one or more arborists to be sure. Because as, as Tom Benjamin, who, who prepared the report, said, this current project is playing Russian roulette with your trees. And I don't really want to play Russian roulette with my trees. OK, so just a couple things that I wanted to illustrate. Um, two of my trees were left off the plan, so they were really weren't brought into consideration. I just, I just wanted to show that they actually exist. Um, I'm sure Ben has saw them on his many strolls through the neighborhood that I have a 20, I had to guess the caliber. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not an arborist, but approximately 27 inch caliber um, Norway maple and a smaller spruce that were not accounted for at all. So they're just not referenced in the plan. Um, again, this is a small point, but I think given that we've seen a lot of haste and careless mistakes, I mean, I was <coughs> astonished to hear that and thrilled that you're planning on keeping that large maple, but the plans say you're removing it. So, like, you know, it's just hard to know exactly what we're preparing for. So it happens that it's not a hickory tree. I actually pressed some leaves, and I was going to bring them in, but I forgot them. Um, and and just just incidentally, our landscape architect said it was one of the largest hackberries he's ever seen in town. So I think it it just merits paying close attention to. Um, I just wanted to identify. This is the the current parking lot plan. I'm not going to spend too much time in this if it's changed, except to say that we know where some of the critical root zones are. Um, and we don't know where some of the others, but right now, right now, most of the parking, uh, uh, plenty of the parking is on the critical root zones of my trees. Um, I really, um, I, re I hope you can see clearly, um, in particular, maple trees. Uh, these, if you, if you look at the picture, I hope it's evident, but those are the roots. They're not under the surface. They don't have a tap root. They're, they're right on the surface. So they're particularly susceptible to anything that might take place anywhere in the critical root zone. I have another picture just showing how those roots, they just pop right up and that's normal for a sugar maple. And in fact, I, I didn't measure, but like um, that, that's a root all the way over there. And that's, well, you know, I should have measured, but it's far. So it's just to say they extend and extend and they're right at the surface. Um, and that was pointed out in Berkshire Design Zone Arborist report that these smaller feeder roots, they go really, really far and they, and they matter to a tree. Um, another issue that, you know, again, may or may not be solved by a new parking lot plan is road salt. And, and w I, you know, we have, I know that the board requested, um, I, I did watch the video from last time, the board requested snow trash removal plans, snow removal plans. I didn't see those. I don't know if they've been come up yet, but but there was a concern that some of those areas, I don't know how to point, like in the corner and the other planting island will become a place where snow accumulates. That's, um, maples are really susceptible to roads. Road salt, which would be sitting on the roots for long periods of time. Um, so, you know, again, I'm, I'm just quoting. Um, <coughs> So I guess I just want to, here was his key recommendation, was 10 feet was a minimum, but that it's be pulled back from the property line out of the root zones of the affected tree. So that's, that's from the landscape architect that I hired. Um, I, I found it really interesting and puzzling, and maybe someone can explain to me, because and, and I did call the tree warden, and I also spoke to Lily Lombard to explain to me how you can both delineate a tree protection zone and build a parking lot there. Like, that seems counterintuitive to me. Lily Lombard confirmed that 
from her perspective as a member of the public, but also with her experience on the Public Shade Tree Commission, that that didn't really make sense. If you are creating a tree protection zone, then how are you then going in and turning it into a parking lot? Again, this is not my area of expertise. Um, you know, this, this is what that's supposed to look like around my trees. So how do, I, I don't get how you then go in and, and build a parking lot. Even with, well, I, I, you know, I was a little confused about is the parking lot raised, is it not raised? I, I compared the elevations, they all looked the same to me. Again, I don't know how to read plans. Um, but uh, but their, our, their arborists did in particular draw attention to these new retaining walls, which I assume would still continue. Um, and if you do look closely at the picture of these new retaining walls, they do require excavating. These are really close to the trunks of my trees right now. I get they'd be farther away, but they require excavating down, and you already saw what my roots look like. So it seems impossible that you could build a sturdy retaining wall and not chop up the roots of sugar maples. Um, okay, so... So, so everything I see here and I, my understanding of the previous stormwater report was that everything about these plants really hinges on a lot of precision and care um, to the things that were spelled out and, and the best intentions, which I truly believe Ben has. However, like we know, I, ju I just looked at some of the history um, you know, both I referenced last time the situation at Hospital Hill where the planning board said do it one way but as Carolyn herself said, they, they don't always follow directions. You tell them to do it one way, they do it another way. In the case of brand new trees, it's rectifiable. In the case of 100, 150 year old trees, it's not rectifiable. And I, I, I don't want to be the gam I don't want to be where the gamble takes place. Those trees are too precious to us monetarily, emotionally, in terms of the shade, and in particular, um, as you probably saw in my letter to the editor, their value in stormwater drainage in a time uh, when we can expect more storms and not, not fewer. Similarly, we know from the trees at, Lily, at uh, Forbes Library, again, best intentions to preserve the trees and pretty much they all died. Um, I, I want to speak, I saw the letter had been uploaded about the condition in which that house was kept we never complained, it was fine. We had a dumpy house with a bunch of students who were lovely, fine. But there was nothing about the management of that property by Ben that indicated great attention to care and detail about the neighborhood. Um, these, the house has been sitting unlocked and open for months. Thank you. Not in an unattractive state. I was concerned that there'd be squatters, like I just, these mattresses have been in the backyard for over six months, maybe a year. Again, I, I had no complaints about the people in that building, but I worry about putting a huge amount of trust that this is suddenly going to turn around into a property that everyone's taking really good care of and suddenly cares a lot about the neighborhood. Um, because I'm going to get to some of the things in the um, special permit, and I'm almost done, um, so this is my current backyard view in terms of what happens, what's the impact that requires a special permit. You'll have to forgive, I, I don't know how to use Photoshop. So this is my projected backyard view. All those trees are gonna be gone except for mine, or at least that was the way I read the plan because they don't mention saving this old tree um, in place, those buildings. Well, um, is the tree gonna be there? Well, I don't... I, no, no. The, 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 these plans said no, Ben oh. said yes, so I, I don't know. I'm asking. I, I think we'd have to see updated yeah. plans. I, yeah. Our intention based on the plan that we submitted for tonight was yes. But it doesn't, we, in the plan it shows it was going to be removed. Okay. Based on what is going to come out when we, when we move the, the, the driveway again. Um, if anything, that should further protect that tree because we would be pushing everything further toward South Street. Um, I did have a couple questions that, again, I guess if everything's moving, I just want to name um, some issues around drainage. I understand, to the best of my limited understanding, these things that the retaining walls were put in because of an 18-inch differential between my property and this parking lot, which would, maybe the retaining walls would address it from the parking spots, but I don't quite understand. I know the fence wouldn't keep it from these planting areas, like how is that water and drainage all not gonna go into my 
property and to the other neighboring properties. I have a similar concern. I understand the carports are a maybe, but again, I just I want to make sure that was addressed. Um, so again, from my layperson's understanding of the special permit, um, without even mentioning the value of trees to stormwater, I, I feel like the current plans don't protect adequately against seriously detrimental uses. It's a gamble. They, one arborist kind of says maybe they would, kind of, if, and one says they won't. And you know, we're watching what happens. When we, we, you know, we don't know what to do, but I think we all, it makes sense to err on the side of caution. Um, I don't see it as a harmonious relationship um, to the open view, if, if my view is suddenly 12 houses as opposed to an open yard. Um, and I think, again, if we're putting these trees at risk, um, in terms of s the stormwater capability of trees, it is not a pos positive relationship to public convenience or welfare. Um, I want to quickly just respond to, I just, I just want to quickly reiterate just one thing from before, only because Ben mentioned it, which is that our narrow street now currently relies really heavily on pullover spots, and especially because of these wide loads. So the concern about parking are as much about like backing up and having a place to park, which would be nice, but whatever. But that we literally, our, our street doesn't accommodate two-way traffic and so we need sufficient places to turn around. And, um, you know, I, 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 I guess I just wanna show that this is really different. That's, that's my how, the, the way it looks right now is spread out and wide. This is the character of the neighborhood that 12 unit kind of thing is really different. And so I'm really hoping that we can pull back on the numbers and gratefully away from as far away as possible from the critical root zones of my trees. And thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. Um, I, you know, I, um, I, I'm very much in favor of a building in the city as that's what I do, but um, I guess I'm just I'm given the fact that most likely potentially we're going to have a continuation of this thing in a, at least a week, and we don't know what's going to happen. I, I myself know that I need to see more. We need to see all the information. Everything changed. I just think that we need to table this as. The comments will potentially affect what we are, the decision we're going to make in the future. And it just doesn't make sense to, uh, you know, rile up a situation which is not cemented. And so, you know, I guess um, I see merits on both sides at this point, but I don't see a merit in, in giving an, uh, an, an okay to something that DPW doesn't have all the facts, we don't have all the facts, and it just makes sense that we know that, we know that, the, uh, that the residents are gonna come again and we don't want them to have to repeat the same thing or at that point be told that, they're, that they need to just remember that, we, that they said it in the future or in the past. I just think we need to stop and it just it's, it just doesn't make sense to continue this conversation. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure about that. I think that the developer is here. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, he's here now, right? And he was not here before. And so I think they can bring that up and he can see, he can read, listen to. And, but I agree to a certain extent with you that you cannot make decisions the way it is, I think. Right? But I think it's a valid point that the developer is here, he knows what's going on, he manifests himself, you guys are here, so you could. I, I guess maybe the better way of saying that yeah. is, I, I guess I'd like to know if we are, <coughs> as of right now, are, as a board, are we going to ask that we, that we see the rest of everything? Mm -hmm. And then if we say that yes, we're go we want to see this in the future, the the residents can make a decision if they want to table what they're saying until the next meeting when we have all of the facts. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I, go ahead, George. 
Well, I, I think, Sam, though, that there are perhaps residents who have some issues or some specific items that might inform the yeah. next version of the plan that the developers are going to bring forward. And I have a couple of questions that I want to ask that might, again, help them get that final package together. Yeah. I mean, so I even though it seems to be a long process. But they're not deciding. Yeah. Not just, so uh, this is true. Uh, but go ahead, Mark. No, I, I agree we're not consultants, but revisions have been made to, to the plan that we just received based on the comments from the residents at the last meeting. So you could argue that further um, changes could be made based on the comments that we'll hear tonight. Uh, either way, there's, there's information that we haven't received, so we can't make a, a determination on. Uh, but you can see that they're trending, even initially, they're trending toward what the residents were requesting. So. I would argue that uh, while I agree we can't make a decision and this draws it out, I would hate to table everything, come back, present, and then have the residents say, well, what about A, B, and C, and then we just prolong <coughs> the, you know, the process again. So I would just ask for folks from the public who would like to make comments, again, that, that we do focus on new issues and, and keeping in mind that there have been some major changes in the submission, so namely both the design, the moving of the parking spaces by 10 feet, you know, will result in a very different site plan, um, and the reduction of yes. a housing unit, um, which also comes in tandem with the reduction in the number of required parking spaces. So, you know, those are, are three fairly significant changes um, that, you know, certainly weren't on the table a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, the, the, the existing concerns about traffic and turnaround, you know, those are things that we will continue to take into consideration that we have heard. And I think we as a board often have a, a challenge to balance, um, you know, <coughs> traffic or parking solutions um, for parking problems, not necessarily trying to apply land use solutions to traffic problems, but kind of figuring out what our role is here. So I think we would like to keep the public hearing open, hear from those of you who've come tonight, um, but to the extent that, that we can be very focused on the ways in which this project has evolved from the prior meeting to try to meet some of the goals that we've talked about last time, um, that would be most beneficial for us as a board to, you know, to hear your thoughts about, again, the reduction of the number of units and the reduction in the required parking spaces, moving of the parking lot, um, and the change in the design. So, you know, those are kind of those very critical changes that have occurred. Um, so we're happy to hear from other members of the public. And I would just also like to reiterate that I don't think under any certain, and you guys are definitely, sounds like you're on um, that same page, but without seeing those revised plans, there's right. really no way that you, that we would certainly right. recommend that you close the hearing. Right. And um, stormwater also informs sort of maintenance and what kind of materials. Many times with, impervi with pervious pavement, you can't use salt, you can't use certain sands. So that's going to affect sort of that, that operations and maintenance will also inform what concerns people that's, might have. I mean, that's partially my point is that I feel like we're talking about something that we don't know. I mean, we don't know if it's going to move. We don't know if it's if we're going to if we're going to lose one, maybe two, two spots. We don't know if we're going to lose two, maybe three parking spots. This is all fictional at this point. This is a fictional development. Uh, it's it's not I don't specific, know if it's fictional. I think it's, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, fictional. it's fictional. No, I'm um, sorry. I, I'm sorry. But I, and maybe I'm tired and sick. <laughs> but at this point, I just don't I'm understand. I'm thinking. I, 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 this, it's, it, it seems like a meeting for a meeting's sake. Mm. Well, I think what we're Sorry. trying to get at from the public is, is again, to, f to hear okay. if there are kind of, um, well, I just want to finish my sentence. You know, if, again, if the project is moving in the right direction, you know, that we're seeing proposed changes, and I think, you know, we have this existing suite of issues that are covered, but, you know, we need to know, or we, people are here, so we want to find out if, if this is moving in a, a positive direction. I think it's, if that's the case, we just need to be perfectly okay with next time them reiterating everything they said today. That's what we have to be okay with. It's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Well, except you don't yeah, you need don't. to take old comments. Like, you've yeah. already but, heard about the turnaround yeah. issue. You've and, already yeah. heard about parking yeah. on yeah, so that if uh, the points can be focused on relating to the benefits of the changes and the, the concept of the changes to come, that could narrow your hearing tonight. Yeah, that's, that's all I'm saying. 
And I'm, you know, if it's helpful for the board or for members of the public, I'm happy to reiterate that list of issues that I mentioned at the beginning of our hearing, what we already have heard, um, if that's helpful. If folks were here last time and you're comfortable with what we've already discussed, we can just go forward. So I will leave it up to you since you're on deck. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Judy Wish, uh, 19 Olive Street. I, I wanted to bring up the other the plans, but this one came up, so maybe somebody could help me on the other ones, except I want to say something about the request that the, the planning board had last time to see how this development fits in, uh, I'd say height-wise, to everything else, and this is what we were shown today. And I can't tell from that, and I would encourage you to take a, a closer look. If I look at the one house I can see, uh, I see quite a differential in height, um, so I, I'm not sure that's adequate for what you were looking for. What I thought was something where you could see it next to how it looks on South Street and how it looks on Olive Street. Because, uh, I th okay, one point. Could someone help me put the plans up? Grading and utilities. Okay, so I want to speak to two changes that were made on the revised plans. One, there is no access to or from South Street from this development. Correct. For cars. For cars. No, for people. For people. Criteria for a special permit states the requested use will promote the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site and on Andresen Streets. In this revised plan, the developer eliminated the pedestrian access to and from South Street. And the second change, which I have a little bit of a different opinion, is that um, the two buildings were joined together, what used to be a two six unit building and a two six unit building into one 12 unit, and I use the word fortress. So this means that no one can walk from or to South Street from the complex, except if the, the everybody, even in those small six ones, has to go out into the parking lot, walk through the parking lot, and that way. The, before, and Carolyn, me and Keith were in your office, and I pointed this out uh, when we came to visit, and you said, oh, right, that should be there. And, it's, and, and, and you saw that as an oversight, and you asked the developers to put in that sidewalk access, and that access has now disappeared. So the new plan is like a house without a front door. So if the city is interested in developing living spaces that interact with the neighborhood and encourage walking and biking, it sure would help to replace that South Street pedestrian walkway back in. So that it wasn't a closed enclave like that. Um, so, you got it? Okay. Final paragraph. So I encourage the planning board to ask for a reduction in the number of units so that the project can be redesigned to include pedestrian access, a safer parking lot with a turnaround so cars and trucks don't have to back out, um, and moving the parking lot so it's not built on top of the canopy covered root system you're doing that, that's great. Thank you. And thank you. Hi there. Hi, I'm Carrie Schlichting. I live at 26 Olive Street. I wasn't able to make it last time, so thanks for keeping comments open sure. for us tonight. Um, my question is, so I don't have experience in stormwater management and trees and traffic, but my understanding of the special permit is that there is a criterion that is for the integrity of the neighborhood. And I just moved in in July, and everyone has been really friendly and really welcoming uh, when I'm outside on the porch, doing yard work. Everyone's come up and introduced, offered tools. So I would like just to say that it is a really welcoming place and not a place that, as someone who knew would coming in would have felt unwelcomed of any sort as a new type of person. Mm -hmm. um, and to that point, I just asked the council, when you're reviewing 
the plans and the, what the special permit is, there is a sentence in it that says there'll be no harm done to a, a single sentence that talks about the integrity criterion. And I just ask that you give us the same weight that the other criteria get because it appears to me that it's intended to have the neighborhood have a voice and we are speaking to the traffic and the scale and the size and the patterns that impact our everyday, not just a couple walkthroughs of a neighborhood. So please continue to respect our views as the neighborhood and it'd be great if you know there are units that are being dropped or parking spaces that we have the chance to collectively comment on that as well in the future. So thank you very much. <laughs> Other comments from the public? Uh, that, uh, hi, I'm Keith. Oh, sorry, there was a woman right behind you who was what? heading. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Keith Pine, 11 Olive Street. I'm Amy's husband and a butter. I'll make this really quick. Um, Ben just keeps changing things. And I, I appreciate he's changing things. He's listening, but he's changing them at the last minute. Again, he submitted his paperwork a day late. I'm sorry, there are rules. You gotta obey the rules. We're, we're not professionals. We need time to check these things. This is a constantly evolving project here. It's a fairy tale, it's fiction. Um, we need him to follow the rules. Somehow, Ben and I were in my driveway at nine o'clock last night with me crawling around finding the property line to show him about our routes. He didn't mention anything about moving the parking lot. So either he made it up this morning or he just knew it and didn't want to tell me about it. Um, again, we cannot prepare. We cannot get ready for this if this is how it's going to be. It's just going to be last minute. We're winging it. Again, I don't like name callings, but if Mr. Lewis is going to call me an elitist, I'm going to say I'm he's gonna actually an experienced ask you to person keep your comments who shouldn't to be us. doing this if he can't keep up on top of things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica LaFleur, 244 South Street. I'm asking that the movement of the dumpster that has been placed is far away from his building. So if you look at the building, he's created what he calls a, an oasis. We have very small yards. We have small oases in our backyards. He has put that dumpster on our property line. I've lived in apartment buildings where they'll build like a little box and put it in the courtyard. Because if you have 12 units and when those people move out, that trash is going to end up on the outside of that one dumpster. So I'd ask that dumpster get moved off our property line. It is literally 15 feet from my great Ocean Stone patio, and I don't want to smell the trash of 12 units in my backyard. Um, also, too, I'm concerned about, again, I know it's personal, but the elitist disturbs me. I bought in a densely populated neighborhood. Again, I'm just going to jump in and pause you for a minute because what, what we want to hear as the board is information that we'll take into consideration as, as we make a decision. So, you know, issues that you, that you may have. Oh my. You know. And it's just saying I bought in this neighborhood mm -hmm. 25 years ago. I chose to live in what I thought was a smart growth area. And there are many areas in this town that aren't. And we would certainly accept it. We accepted the one across the street. It made sense. We could go in and out of the property. It was smaller units so that we don't have to worry about what exists in Amherst. That's what our concern is. You know, you have a four bedroom apartment. A family isn't gonna rent a four bedroom apartment for 3,600 say. They're gonna buy a house. Who is gonna rent that is four or five students. Put somebody else in the basement. And we understand that, but not so much of it. And that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Joseph Sharp. I live at 56 Olive. Uh, we have a little 1790 farmhouse down there with close proximity to the turn and drop into the meadows area, which, for better or worse, I'm compelled to call the swamp. But uh, regardless, we see parking problems all the time. And to cite statistics that there haven't been as many complaints as would justify <coughs> thinking about this is not meaningful when the people who have been complaining saw no response that was meaningful. As 
fine to have the police come out and talk to the people and say, hey, dude, you're on the wrong side. Well, get the street department out and put the signs back up that say parking one side only. Secondly, give them a bloody ticket once in a while, and they won't do it. Plus, as was mentioned, it is a narrow street. There are more narrow, of course, and all I know is that if we plan to leave our house and go downtown, God forbid we wanted to go to the supermarket or whatever, so we drive, fine. But first we have to check the street and make sure there are no moving vans, there are no plumbers, heating and air conditioning people, electricians, yard specialists, cleaning, mowing, etc. because they consistently park on the no parking side. This does not seem to concern them and it doesn't seem to concern anybody else very much. So of course they don't get roasted. I think somebody needs to volunteer to go roast them. But I will not do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Certainly sounds like there needs to be some enforcement. Conversation about all the planning criteria stressing the ability to walk downtown. Good luck. We will not go into the fact that in many of the developing countries and worse that I've worked in, the sidewalks were actually better than all the streets and portions of South Streets. If they want to really make this a place where people are going to live and walk downtown, I hope that any new concrete sidewalks they propose to put in are indeed recognizing both grade to the curbs for drainage and the pitch. I mean, I have spent several winters, I mean, we moved here and, well, I moved in in 2009. My wife came in 2008, but the State Department sent me to Iraq, so thank you very much. I got here later, and I soon discovered, as I was walking my dog, that there was always one house, up on the corner of the street, actually, where I could always count on having a skating rink on both the Ola Street part and on the South Street part. Large puddles that would freeze over just as beautiful as any skating rink I've ever seen. And I've seen a few of those too. But <coughs> in addition, let's assume that they put in a good sidewalk that doesn't retain large puddles of water every time it rains or we get a warm day. But we actually have people using these sidewalks. They're also going to, in many cases, want to cross South Street. Good bloody luck. There's been one person very badly injured, exchange student, on South Street at the nearest crosswalk because we do not take the perspective of the people in Amherst, say, where a person walks up, they hit a button, and immediately two posts, one on each side, become <coughs> flashing. Or God forbid, maybe there's a third in the middle. Wouldn't that be different? All right, so that we don't have a safe crosswalk, that could become one of the uses of these funds that you're speaking mm -hmm. of. All right. And there are Undoubtedly, other things that I could remember more of them if I didn't get sidetracked. Thank you. Regardless. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Looks like we may have one more. One more person. Good evening. Hi, I'm Cheryl Delisi. I live at um, 248 South Street. And um, there haven't been really very many, or I, I, this is the first time I've actually seen this. Um, 
Um, n there's no views of what it will look like from my end, because mm -hmm. I'm on the other corner. Um, I, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, I just think that I didn't realize that the integrity of the neighborhood was something that was supposed to be maintained. Um, that um, my neighbor um, put so well. Mm -hmm. um, I just have to say, there's no way that the integrity of the neighborhood could stay with such a massive block of units. Uh, I am going to look over. My view is also going to be affected. I'm just going to see like, like a like a fortress, um, and that obviously upsets me. Um, but um, the one thing that um, I I just want to reiterate. Um, is that um, the, the care that has been taken for the property on the corner in question. I just want to pause you for a moment because sure. we, we want to really kind of focus on the Okay, the but plans. I think it should be an issue because it's been dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so I, how can you trust somebody with, a, you know, like all of a sudden it's going to be taken care of? Um, it's a concern. It's a concern. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have heard from members of the board we you know we have heard from Carolyn that you know we are we are not going to be able to approve you know this plan tonight without seeing because these changes are very extensive and and they are good changes um, that are responsive to a number of things that have come up but you know we do we will need an opportunity to really scrutinize you know not just the new site layout but lighting plan planting plan you know all of those um, additional plans that that would be part of this um, you know and so so there will be an additional opportunity for folks to see those plans and respond to those changes um, I, you know I, our public hearing is still open so if there are other members of the public who would like to say something new um, about this project you do still have an opportunity to do that as well as when it's continued as well as when it is continued next time as well yes go ahead uh, my Hi. name is Denise McConnell. I'm on property at 227 South Street. And um, I just wanted to say two things. One is that um, I'm quite familiar with the zoning in this town and the zoning revisions that went through a few years ago um, and was a part of some of that work. Um, I do want to say that one of the conversations that's gone around, so part of the zoning revisions, as you guys know, um, a big part of that motivating factor was to provide infill development in our town to allow us to build within existing footprints, to think about how we can increase density to allow people to live more sustainably in our community while maintaining the communities that we live in. And, and that's the big question I think here, is like what is the community that we, that we wanna create um, in recognition that things do change. I wanna read a quick definition of infill because I think it's relevant to the conversation. Infill is the urban planning term for the re rededication of land in an urban environment, usually open space, to new construction. Infill applies within an urban um, polity to construction on any undeveloped land that is not on the urban margin. I think the critical point there is that, that typically when we're talking about infill, we're thinking about the, you know, the broken tooth, right? It's that there's a spot that we're filling that's underutilized. It's a, side lot that becomes an additional single family home. It's not just leveling existing structures in order to add that level of density. So that's one point and we can deliberate what the definition of infill is. The second point would be that um, the special permit process with respect to zoning was intended to provide a mechanism for our communities to push the envelope, to really think differently about the kinds of communities to experiment and to test out ideas. In doing that, I think that you all have incredible, credible, incredible influence on thinking about the precedent that you're setting for what South Street will look like. Because if one unit is accepted, and I say this in both ends of the spectrum, if one unit is accepted, you've set precedent for what can be approved legally by special permit for all other properties that line that street. So I just say I think we should think deeply about what we're listening to with respect to community <coughs> relationships. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Any other comments from? Uh, just a couple, just to 
to review some of the concerns that I have moving forward, and, and some have been addressed. I'd, I'd like to see, there's been talk about a turnaround, a dedicated turnaround spot, and, and maybe in moving the parking lot and reducing the number of parking lot spaces and potentially eliminating one or two units there would provide space to add that dedicated turnaround spot. I'd like to see that. Relocating the dumpster, um, if, if the same argument applies if, if reconfiguring the parking lot allows for a better spot for the dumpster I'd certainly be in favor for that and then to uh, one of the neighbors uh, points in mind as well I think and when you brought it up Sam initially with looking for elevations trying to get a sense of the massing it's certainly better than it was before but it's but I but there's no real kind of shot from Olive Street or shot from South Street and I think we went through this process on a couple developments in mm -hmm. Florence and it was very beneficial to get that, uh, to get those side-by-side -side views uh, to make that comparison from just from a massing standpoint. Uh, I'm not so much opposed to the infill concept, uh, but I don't know that that means you need to physically put on that property as much as will fit. You know, that doesn't. Necessarily so you would right you'd well. be interested in seeing a reduction the, in the number of units. A reduction in units and also better elevations to to get a sense of the massing. I think these are these are good. I I just like to see maybe one a, a dead on from Olive Street if it lends itself to that or. What one further to the, I guess towards East Hampton. E, right. I'd like to. I mean, that relative. You can see that house. I guess where the large tree is. What is it? What what, what direction? Is that? South. Is that south on south? Yeah, south and south street. South and south. So south and south, I'd like to see what that looks like relative to that, um, and not just the like. Right now, I have a picture of the comp of the, the complex. Actually, looks very nice, but the I'd like to see see it relative to the other other property. Jeff, is that something you think would be feasible to? So you're saying the the is this the view that you want? You just want to see it bigger. Well, I'd like to see it bigger, but I'd also just like to see if if I was on South Street staring at maybe just a whatever three of the. I guess I can look at the map. Is that that upper view? Is it just too small for us to see that yeah. that's what it is? I made a printout. I guess I'd like to see this. Like right now, we're seeing this. I'd like to see this right here. want to see if this is what you're looking for so that I know what oh, to give you. That is much better, yeah. Okay. 100%. That's what that picture is. Ooh, that's what that mm -hmm. picture yeah. was. I, I think it's not, it's, it's, it's not the same thing, but what, uh, from a pure massing mm. standpoint, when the Cumberland Farms came in front of us with a proposal in Florence to go at that corner mm -hmm. uh, of Main Street, and it from a special permit and massing standpoint, it it did not fit. It didn't. It, the integrity of the neighborhood was lost because yeah. of that. It was rejected, and I think correctly so. And a building that that more accurately reflects the surrounding areas was was put in its place. This is a highly visible corner. It's not it's not corner of Maine, but it's highly visible. And I I just want that to. We have an opportunity to get the massing correct, and I want to do that. Uh, I'd like to, to the neighbors to have to have given more uh, time to see any change that you guys do. Say it again. The change that you do, that the neighborhood, the fellows can access it with enough time to go over. It seems that it's they need it, right? So. So um, <laughs> suggesting. I don't know how much time. I it mean, is. we don't t typically. They're they're for the board. We ask at least. I mean, in this case, we need stormwater um, mm -hmm. calculations to be reviewed. So we probably need at a staff level a little uh, more than a week, maybe a week and a half. Um, but um, there's definitely no hard and fast rule about when um, plans need to be submitted. But it certainly makes review. Um, more timely and certainly the day of doesn't give very much um, time for anybody to review including staff so um, I'm not sure. Hold on by that. 
I mean, I would suggest a, a, a week uh, um, at least, but uh, in, and that's no guarantee that the staff can, DPW in particular, can evaluate calculations. So I think that plays more into maybe sort of thinking about when you want to do the continuation, so then when you can back in the date from that, um, and how much time it would take to incorporate the changes that were raised as possibilities tonight. So I don't know if you want to ask um, Berkshire Design how long they think it would take to sort of reorient the site and then sort of figure out a continuation continuation date from there. So could you give us that? Well, I would suspect that we could have revised plans and stormwater calcs in a week and a half, you know, two weeks, somewhere in that. I mean, it's, it's going to take us, you know, several days to compile all the information, lighting, photometrics, stormwater, utilities, all of that stuff. Um, and get that off in a package to DPW for their review as well as, you know, as well as the planning office. Um, you know, I think a week and a half is... And the drawings, whatever it is to be drawn and showed to, to the neighborhoods. When, so when we can have to have that ready and then when they'll be, you know, have access to that. Well, when they submit it, we post it on the um, webpage and people can come either come into the office and look at them or look on the webpage. So as soon as Berkshire Design submits them to the city, they become available to the public through the website. See, one year and a half, then how long after, or how long? Well, our next meeting would be, it would be the 25th, because it wouldn't be in time for the, the meeting on October 11th. So it would be October 25th is when we would be continuing. Okay. Makes sense. That would be and awesome. is everybody going to be here October 25th? I will. Okay. Yes. Check. More comments on the project itself from this side of the table? So. I forget um, at our first, the, the initial meeting, whether we went over the photometric plan, and we were happy with that. And I, I understand it'll be changed now because the parking lot will be moving. Yeah, we didn't have that itemized as. Yeah. I think that was in the original staff uh, memo, and back to the applicant that they, it, it exceeds the allowances for light levels, and the um, posts should be reduced to more of a residential scale. We did, we did address that. And does, I didn't see that. Has the applicant seen this, uh, the staff comments this time around? Um, yes, I yeah, provided okay. information. There wasn't much difference because no. were, yeah. I just want to make sure what's been heard tonight plus, yeah. yeah plus okay. what's been submitted to us. Kristen, or George, keep going. No, that's good. You're good? Okay. I just have a question about um, what's the proposed front door, if you will, for these side units. Is it the, f is it the furthest to the outside, or is it entry on t into the, in from the courtyard? So there's egress on both onto Olive or South for each of those units, yeah, I can see and, both the and into the courtyard. The, in our, in our in sort of, what we were envisioning is yep. that those who are parking are going to be using the courtyard side. If anyone is walking, they would be able to walk out their unit directly onto either Olive or South, and then head to town or wherever they're walking. So they'd be walking on the grass, on the grassy. Yeah, I was going to say, is this grass out here towards East yeah. Hampton or, yes. So not a sidewalk. I think that's why they are asking. It had originally been a sidewalk. It was originally. That's what they were talking about earlier. That's, I just wanted to clarify that. There, there is a sidewalk on South Street. Right. In front of the, They're saying right. a sidewalk behind the units, right? Like on the, like, yeah, on the, like on the south parallel side. Parallel to Olive Street. South. Yeah. I yep. just want to thank you for, I just want to be clear that I'm ha we're happy to make revisions. I just want to know what we're, what right we're there. Yeah. This is where you're talking about? Yeah, I'm just asking if people are using that as their front entrance. No. Uh, no. No what? They, no, they, they likely wouldn't be using it as their front Okay, so they you're would, in. They would be coming in, parking here, yeah. or 10 feet over from here, and coming in through the courtyard. And this is really, you know, these are uh, available back patios, and there is egress available there, right. but the intention is really that's that's sort of the back door. So then you are funneling people through the courtyard. Through the courtyard, how do they get to South Street? On to Olive, walking to South. Here? Uh, right and anyway, here? I live in the middle unit this? closest to South Street. This unit? Uh, nope, keep going towards me. There you go, now go to the right. So if I'm in one units. of those, yeah, if I'm in one of those smaller sure. units and I want to walk downtown, well, how mean, am I getting, in theory, I mean, I can get there anyway. In my, in my head, if I'm walking toward town, yeah. I'll probably go into the courtyard. Right. Sorry. Yep, I got it. Out onto the street yep. and then go out this way. If for whatever reason I was walking toward East Hampton, I would come out the patios and then walk out. 
that way. But it, it, it's, it felt like it was unnecessarily paving and putting down more material when, for the most part, that's really just an, you know, a secondary means of egress. And we, we figured it would be nicer to have a grass buffer than, yeah. than the back. So will people feel like you're walking through their yard? The, in the smaller units? Yeah. No, they're, they're um, enclosed patios. I think previously there was a break at the front, as was noted, so you could come in off of South Street and come into the courtyard that way, which would be the path of, um, you know, the affinity path if you were going to be heading south. Right. Is this middle unit right here that has no stairwells, no this doors? Unit. Is that just open space? That's no. one huge unit? No. Uh, it's, a, it's a unit, yeah. It's just as because it's a corner, it's you know we had to be a little creative with how we were designing it. But um, yeah, there, there's egress both out onto yeah. Olive and Krista. Uh, I had the same. Uh, I had the same question. Yeah, actually, it just doesn't show. We yeah. we, re we redesigned that corner, so now if you look here, you see sort of this is the main door now, which sort of faces the corner. So, so that we can better, because we've now this is the third meeting. Um, I would I'd appreciate it if you give us sort of a, sh a small history, uh, show us what we were looking at week one, sure. week two, week three, so that we are all on the same page on the version that we're You're talking saying about. For the what next we saw at the first meeting, then what you see tonight, yeah, and then ultimately what we submit next time. Is that what? Yeah, you're yeah. I mean, right version now, ones, two, and three. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yes, I, I just wanted to ask one more thing that just occurred to me. Uh, thrilled again about the move, potential movement of the driveway. I just wanted to ask the board to consider. We had some concerns already about the eight, the very narrow entrance sort of becoming a pinch, what an architect called a pinch point, with people sort of needing to turn in and come out quite trickily, right, 18 feet if one, especially if it's a minivan or a truck or whatever. I wonder, continuing to move that driveway closer to South Street where because as the fire department noted, the it's got these wide turns in so people kind of peel in. So I just want to put that out there to be considerate. What's the safety of, does it make sense to widen that opening at least so that there's an 18 foot Entrance. It's it's gonna if it gets closer to South Street, I wonder if it'll get increasingly sort of dangerous as a pitch point. As I don't know, but it's too bad. Can, Can I, I ask a question? Uh, let me interject. I'm just gonna I'll let my board members say something, right. and then we'll come right to you. Yes. Uh, it, it's just in terms of yeah, everyone wants something that's shrunk a little bit, I think. But I'm just thinking about rent rents for this this space, and I just really wonder if. Just in terms of you thinking about it, if you really would get like you wouldn't lose that much rent, rent um, like a, a large two a large two unit place doesn't rent for that much more than um, these smaller units, and I'm just wondering if you had the smaller units, you'd be able to in, instead of having a, the large the larger unit, if you'd be able to do more with that, you may you know get rid of these larger units and just have smaller units, the whole thing smaller. It's probably a business decision that he'll think about. I mean, I don't, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's about shrink. I'm just giving You're saying in reducing the number of units, reducing both the, the of size of each unit yeah. and the number of units. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if your recommendation is rooted in a massing or a land use. That's, what, that's all I'm saying. Okay, yeah. versus, yeah, we shouldn't be I'm not, business I'm, advice I'm to. Sorry, <laughs> and 100%, I'm just saying that, uh, might be able to shrink your space. But, but I would just say in terms of um, kind of increasing the variety of housing stock in given neighborhoods, you know, there are families who are here just for a year or short term that might like a larger apartment that aren't just going to get a smaller apartment and this might be a really attractive to them. So there's two sides to, to that coin. Maybe you had a question? Yeah. yeah. I, is it possible for the board to require something like the um, addition of a bicycle station and um, 
speed bumps on Lower Olive Street and Lower Fort Street where there are no sidewalks? I think when it comes to transportation and parking interventions like that, that isn't something that we can condition, correct? I mean, we can't, re we can't require any changes to the public way, but you know, the Transportation and Parking Commission has evaluated a, a lot of different traffic calming mechanisms, and, and that part of the payment for traffic mitigation goes into the fund that covers the cost of that. So I think those are good ideas, but you know, there's a different mechanism for kind of getting them into the pipeline. There's also um, needed to be data collection to see if speeding is actually a problem right. before you figure out what the solution is. And of course, on-street parking is a traffic calming uh, mechanism as well that works um, to slow right. cars. So it's really, the board couldn't be in a position to say you have to put traffic you know, speed bumps because there's no data showing necessarily that they're speeding consistently enough to Even warrant that. Even if it's about not having sidewalks. Well, no, that's different. Yeah. So if there's a sidewalk issue, certainly money that this mm -hmm. project is required or, or improvements the project's required to make could be go, could go towards sidewalk, um, expand, you know, extension of sidewalks. That's certainly the case that mm -hmm. could happen. Um, but again, that's what the traffic mitigation um, money is for. I just have a comment about the design of the project that strikes me. I was looking at the photometric plan and realized, because I forgot of all the revisions, that at one point there was two buildings. Now it seems like one building. Yeah. And I wonder if, because when I looked at this, I thought, oh, yeah, it doesn't look that massive. And then you go back to the front plan, and, and my perception is, seems massive when I look at it from here. And I'm wondering, is there a way for you to accomplish your goals at, in, of the infill but break these buildings up so there are maybe maybe they're in more separate clumps, so to speak, so that it would feel a little more open and not so massive, but yet you'd still be creating the amount of units that you need to make your project financially work for you as well. And we'd still get the infill, but it just wouldn't seem so massive. It seems like one ginormous roof line, many pitches, but you don't see much in that neighborhood aside from across the street. But I, I know it's a lot to go back and redo plans, and I understand all that. But just wonder if that's a consideration that you already explored and been like, yeah, it didn't work. So uh, can I just, just to respond, one of the things that we did here was that in looking at the building from up close, it looked like you were just sort of looking straight up at the building. And so I asked John to take a, his architectural pencil to paper and by this unit was re reformatted. It used to have the same pitch lines as these. It was stepped back, mm -hmm. but it sort of looked like this. And then what we did was we changed that. And I, um, oh, you're Sam. Sam. What Sam had suggested about showing sort of a versions one, two, and three when we come back next time. I think that you'll see that what we were responding to that concern about well, what will you be able to see sort of as you're looking at it, and it, it looks much cleaner now than, than where it was last month um, to me. But uh, and w when we decided to unite these buildings, uh, that was a decision that we felt looked better. But I'm I'm happy for us to take a look at seeing what it would like look like to, for them to be separated. I just want to be clear on what the purpose is of doing that so that when we separate them, we know what we're looking at. Yeah. I mean, you, we, you know what we're trying to achieve, I, I should say. Yeah. It just seems like when I'm looking at infill in other areas, it, it, it is like a single family home, perhaps with a, it was just at a property today, a single family home, they had a driveway and in the back, they had another building that they infilled in. And while there's <clears throat> a lot more opportunity on that property to house people and do certain things, it just didn't seem as massive had they not taken that building, turned it, made it an L, and then attached it to their current roof. And now you're looking at something that's mm. like. Be because wow. of how the site is, because we're trying to pull it as far away from the neighbor's trees as possible, because we're, you know, yep. we are trying to be sensitive in that way, we, you know, we, we pulled everything as, as far as we could. Um, 
Yeah, I just think I think that's it's a good point. I don't know that anyone else has you know I I can see it working. You know, has kind of two different buildings, but I don't know that anyone else has raised it sufficiently to kind of require you to yeah. kind of crumple it up in a ball and throw it Start away. Up. Um, it was just there. Well, I just noticed it was yeah. on the photometric plan right. at some point. As two separate. That was her point with the fortress kind of that was like in, implied by fortress yes. meant we don't want a fortress. And that was also my point. From my perspective on the other corner, I just see this massive wall. Fortress. Okay. Well, I mean, if that is, if that is something that you feel like you could accomplish, I know in the original plan there were also concerns raised about it being two separate buildings. There were a couple of comments from the public that yeah. people didn't like. You know, we can go back and look. So, you know, we heard some things and we had some information submitted that people weren't happy with that. Um, I think if that's something that would One achieve a reduction in massing, if it is something that could be accommodated, then. I just want to be clear on, on what it is that you're asking is to separate the buildings or not to separate the buildings? What Krista is saying is to separate separate the buildings for, so uh, for the purposes of having a discontinuous, not one so contiguous building. Um, and that may not be possible on the site, but that's, I don't know if other members of the board are having that same inclination that, you know, you're not comfortable with, with this new design. Um, if you are. Uh, he mentioned that design is not necessarily like that, right? You mentioned that design, the current one, is not like the one that's showing there, right? Well, well, no. Well, no, this is the what we're proposing is will likely look very similar to this, oh. and we're going to be talking about shrinking it from the parking lot side to best accommodate the street. And that's what so reduction in units, but the same yeah. overall the design. Same I, yeah. So I would think by putting two separate buildings, the space that's going to be created, the open space for Petita, is going to be very minimal. No, or sidewalk wise, so it won't really be that um, um, uh, obvious about the desizing of the building, so to speak. You know, it's just going to be like a narrow alley almost in order for them to do what they need to do. Um, and if it's just on that, um, the south to East Hampton side of the street in the back there, um, I don't think we'll even really see it in the roof line changes. So, I, personally, I, I don't, I don't think we need to separate the buildings out. Yes. But uh, again, there's six or seven of us here. So, I didn't have the. I mean, I liked how it had changed from last month. You know, that design-wise, it looked better than the two separate buildings. But that's. Um, I do want to give Jana a chance to speak. If you have anything you want to add, or questions. Thank you. I'm having a hard time visualizing what that would look like. Again, split into two different spaces. I do think that the corner unit now looks better and improves the, the streetscape, although it does seem like if you were to cut the building there that that would, I mean, you could cut it in the back where it used to be cut and cut it additionally there, which would create essentially three separate buildings, but then I think you would lose the benefits that we've gained from this new design. So. Um, it would give a quality more like the existing site where, I mean, it would feel more like, a little bit more like two properties rather than one big unit, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I'm not sure it's gonna go that far toward addressing the concerns, I think. Mm -hmm. um, other mechanisms, taking the big unit off the back, maybe reducing the size of the, you know, migrating them, I think will do, ultimately do more than yeah. um, cutting up I think what I'm hearing from everyone is the overall goal is this, this um, sort of, you know, reduction in massing a little bit, but that doesn't necessarily hinge on breaking this up into yeah. two buildings. That, that That is a goal that could potentially be achieved in other ways, especially with eliminating that, that one larger unit at the, at the entryway. Um, and so I think that we could probably look at something that, you know, that gets much closer, but, you know, keeps this configuration. Um, just, a, you know, a quick recap, because we are going to continue this hearing, so we will take a motion shortly, but um, Mark did a good recap earlier about if you could consider moving the dumpster um, further from the property line where it is now. I know it's, you know, it is 15 feet 
but if there is another you know another location for that dumpster that would be something we'd remind me what's the buffer between that neighbor and the parking lot is it a six foot fence it's a six foot fence, six six, foot fence. Yeah, so six. it's not going to be a visual thing certainly from their second floor it would be so if it is just odiferous that's another thing totally but yeah. it won't be a visual and I, in, in our landscaping what we have done is put a tree next to it so as to try to obstruct its view from an <coughs> elevated position from the neighboring property. Okay. But um, okay. How strongly do you feel about that, Mark? Well, I'm just saying if, yeah. if the reconfigured parking lot lends itself okay. to some creative license with the dumpster location, that would be preferred. But, but, okay. But I would want to say I, I wouldn't want it in the courtyard. That's going to be kind of the living play space for children, people to socialize. I wouldn't want to kind of hide it within that courtyard there. I don't think that would be so, Sorry. I, I feel like I just heard two different things. So uh, I, I've, we're trying our very best to hear your comments and respond to them. And I, you want. So what, where I think we to the extent that you can, right. ba based on your reorganization of the parking lot, mm -hmm. is there another place you can locate the dumpster but not in the courtyard? Yeah. Or, right. or show to yeah. the left or... It's, it's always and be and if not, I mean, it's, then yeah. maybe putting it behind. Or clearly right. show how it's going to be screened from the abutters okay. from both height yeah, and setback. But it's going to be in my living space. Yeah. Why is it, it, I understand protecting the courtyard in their living space, where that dumpster is, I'm right behind it. So it's my living space that's impacting. I mean, uh, you know, the yeah. the challenging part of all this is is managing private property development, and everybody's property comes up against somebody else's. So you know, we're gonna dumpster for 12 apartments next yeah. to his building. There's right. Too many apartments in one space. It's it's very simple. <coughs> is he moving the property line on the East Hampton side when he removes those sidewalks? Not to or not. I mean, we are going to see plans that have that have parcel lines. So we are going to do our best to see what it looks like to have a reduction in units. There is going to already be a reduction. Um, you know, Mark has adequately uh, articulated that. You know, we would like to see a reduction. So we see a few from East Hampton because that's what I'm looking at. We have asked for that, and that was provided tonight as well. And so we will. You know, we we have asked for that, and I assume we're going to see that again when there is something different to look at. That view from South Street right. sort of toward where and, two yep. from and all Yes, and from Our Olive Street. So from, you know, from all three <coughs> ways that, that somebody could see this parcel, that's the, the photo simulation that we'd like to see. You could add the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. right. Um, when I reviewed the video from last time, you explicitly asked for snow removal question. and trash removal, and that wasn't included. Can you, if that's required, can you just reiterate that so that we can see that next time. Sure. So, um, just reader, you know, there are a set of of recommendations and conditions that that do carry over because these are continued hearings. So, but you they know, it met for tonight. So, I just like maybe they were off someone's radar. They forgot or something. <laughs> so, I just, so it was a, it was explained in the text how they were going to deal with snow removal and and. Um, trash removal so um, that's in the that's not on the plans it's in this submitted text right? one of the re yeah I'm, I'm sorry if, if, if you felt like we didn't respond to that I felt like we did respond to it the the dumpster location where it currently is is located at the end of the long driveway in so that so as to allow a, a recycling vehicle or to come in and to come in yeah, to lift yeah. and to and then so there we never see a plan that a paper plan that shows you know snow removal per se because it's it's um it's something that that is but described. described. In I, I've been it could also be you so could also reinforce it in a condition. Oh, so so what Carolyn just said is we could also reinforce the the any requirements around snow removal and trash removal in a condition, okay. um, and so that's okay. reasonable. We've done that before, um, and that's something we would probably and just ask what that looks like so that we can prepare. So like, um, so that we have a plan to have a. It, like exactly what I said is that or are you looking for something more than that no I think what you said fine what we have done on, on other plans is when it looks like there isn't any physical space on a site uh -huh. to actually pile up snow we've conditioned that snow you know if it can't effectively be piled up yep. somewhere that it be removed from yep. the site yep. and, and, and we have snow pushes available here but if it if it got to the point if we got one of those huge 12 inch nor'easters whatever it is 
you know, we, we are prepared to have our snow team come in and, and take that off. So. On the site across, it was required that they do trash barrels instead of a dumpster. Can we request that for here as well? I think that that was related to the number of units, right? Eight units? Uh, versus it was, it was related to not being able to also. back up onto South Street. So this is going to require backing up onto Olive. But in that case, I was here. It was because we couldn't have a truck backing up onto South Street. Right. So that, that's why the dumpster was taken off. Right. It would be awesome if we also didn't have a truck backing up onto an increasingly big I think that's something street. that will continue at our next yeah. hearing. Um, that's not something that I think we're going to iron out right. tonight because we are going to see very different plans. So I would love a motion to continue our hearing to October 25th. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yes, go ahead. I, I just want to be sure that I, I'm hearing what your full concerns are so that we are fully equipped to be able to do it. You're, in, you're interested in, here in seeing a head-on view from Olive Street. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that the submissions are done earlier. You, want, you would like to see versions one, two, and three of the project. Yes. You have a question about the garbage and recycling, and you want to see that it's enclosed and landscaped as we have in, intended. Yes. And you'd like to see houses added to the model of the bird's eye view, in addition to the 10 foot yes. being pulled off and likely the accompanying dropping of a unit. Correct. Is there anything else? I heard scale back. Yeah, I heard scale back too. I heard smaller. Yeah. yeah. I'd add to that the, the parking turnaround. Um, so I'm sorry, Mr. S you said a, a parking turnaround. A dedicated so parking turnaround. Just for if our for our application is a visitor spot. No, no, someone parks in the visitor yeah. spot. It, if, if, if our site, let's say, just requires no, having a de dedicated a dedicated yeah. striped off turnaround spot. That so is, it's not meant for parking. So if a vis if a visitor could be in the visitor parking, sure. which would el eliminate the turnaround. So. If the, if the reoriented parking lot allows itself with reduced parking and reconfiguration allows for a dedicated turnaround, that's what I'd like to see. A dedicated turnaround, okay. And right now, we're, I'm uncomfortable promoting backing out onto Olive Street. That's, that's a no-no. Mark, are you yeah. uncomfortable using the, the, the striped area next to the handicap space as turnaround? I mean, is that? I mean, that's you're not supposed to use a handicap right. spot yeah. for that. Yeah. Well, the, the adjacent yeah. part, the sure. turning around, not yeah. the space, not but the use, no, not the handicap right. space. Right, right. Oh, the adjacent yeah. part. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know. Follow the rules. But just as a turnaround, though, you're just you're in the car, you pull in, you pull out, backwards, you reverse your car, because what we're doing, Mark, I think, is creating a new standard for parking lots. Every parking lot now has to have a turnaround spot um, if it's that tight. So no, I think we're the, the standard is not to back out onto the street. Yeah. And and my concern is if the parking lot's full and you get in there and say, Oh, there's nothing here and now you're backing up. Right. And if you know, worst case scenario, if there's a handicapped person in that mm -hmm. spot and they're getting in or out of their car or whatever, or there's a van there, or, you know, mm -hmm. it's not unusual to see uh, a a turnaround in a parking lot. Right. A, a long narrow parking lot. Usually it's at the end or on the side or something just to, for just for this purpose. Well, the loss so, of a unit and the reduction in number of required spaces will, will free up. You know, that's my thought. The, so, the so maybe that hashed out area not just visitor have wider. Additional so, visitor parking, okay. and so that's. Yeah, I would rather see it be open space if we're freeing up some parking spaces rather than this once in a very rare time when <laughs> there's not going to be a free spot to back in and out. If they're going to free up space, I think open space or protection of the trees would be more valuable, you know, long term. Yeah. I agree. That would trump. I'm just saying there's a, there's, there's a parking lot layout that we haven't seen yet. Yep. Right. And, and so with that so revised as layout, as it we're lends designing it As we're thinking about adding, and it, let's say that we're talking about 16 spaces. Mm -hmm. um, when, when, we, when I was here for the 227 South Street meeting a mm -hmm. couple of weeks ago, the I heard at that meeting that the, utilizing the striped handicap parking space as a turnaround was sufficient. And so I assumed that it would be sufficient for our project as well. And so I just want a, a clarification about that. I mean, yeah. with regards to sort of expected day-to-day -day usage, I imagine that the parking lot is going to only really be full overnight. And overnight, and there being a visitor, you know, multiple visitors in the multiple spots, I, I, I appreciate the, the concern. I want to, now that we're like really in the weeds about it, I want to yeah. make sure that we're, we're planning appropriately for what actions are likely to be. Yeah. So would you rather it look like a visitor spot? Would you rather it be 
uh, the striped spot next to the handicap? Would an expanded striped spot next to the handicap be? I, I, I'm just trying to understand. Yes, I, I wouldn't want to use a, a visitor parking spot as your as your dedicated turnaround because if somebody's in there, you don't have a turnaround. Okay. So maybe that but the striped, striped spot. Yes, would be sufficient. if it if it allows it to be a little bigger, I think that would be just beneficial. Just it doesn't. Clear, it doesn't. You can't require visitor parking spaces. Right. So, right. You we know. can only require the 16. That right. would be. Yeah. yeah. That would be required. Um, yes. Did you have a I, comment or a question? Yeah, I just had a question. Okay. Um, can you require those spaces to be assigned and numbered to prevent people from, like, willy nilly trying to find parking all the time and then coming back and out and going to see how many parking is on? That, that was. Uh, our I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's outside of our yeah. our purview. Yes, sir. I, I think it has to be emphasized, and I. And I'm going to ask I'm you to come to the podium and sure. state your name and your uh, address, uh, please. Uh, Dan Levy, I live at 50 Ravel. Um, you know, I, I think the center, the the central argument for and most of us here from the neighborhood. We're going to ask you to talk to us. <laughs> the central argument from most of the neighborhood is that there's too much house and too yeah. much people, too many people, on too small a lot, and that's how it stands. Nobody wants a piece of urban Chicopee dumped in our neighborhood. And that's what that looks like, Chicopee. Um, Some people are from Chicopee. Yeah. I, don't, I don't begrudge anyone from Chicopee. I just didn't move there. Yeah. It's closer to work. I could live in Chicopee. It would be handy. I live in Northampton because it looks like Northampton. And I don't, you know, if you want to turn South Street into Chicopee, this is a start. So something has to happen to continue to give some sense of space, uh, natural growth, trees, a uh, neighborhood. And I think without fewer people, substantially fewer people, fewer units, less size, that would be very hard. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Lisa Germanowski, um, 14 Ravel Avenue. I heard talk of having a, a view of the neighborhood again, and I heard Ben say an aerial view, but I'd really like to see a front-on view, because aerial view, I don't think you're going to get the full impact of how big that is and how small our house is. Yep. So the, the photo simulations that, that we did see, we will see again. That's okay. The photo simulations are from sort of a ground level view. and. Yes, ma'am. I don't remember seeing a photo simulation coming in from East Hampton. I'm, I'm never Correct. Worth we, there I'm was a small that. version, so it was yeah. very, very small on the screen. We have asked for it. That's what Sam was asking for as well, so we all do want to see that view, and that, that has been requested for the next set of plans. And I would love to see that wall chopped up. I'm the person that is going to be looking at that wall. It's literally 40 feet from my house, mm -hmm. and right now I look out and grass. Are we going to have a view from Olive Street by White's? really nice yes so know. we've asked for three views okay. so from we have a view from olive street on the, so all three house. views we will see so so that would be four views olive street south street well i think he's requesting from his individual from property his rather no, no, you can be in front of my house you don't have to be in my backyard okay, you can not just be in front of my house the, looking down the, olive street this just so you see this is amy's vehicle <laughs> And the fence and the yeah, side I'm of the sorry, house. I so I'd be happy to yeah, I, show you the I make a mo move motion. Motion. Thank you. Yeah. A motion to a motion continue. To adjourn this meeting. Um, we're not adjourning not this. Adjourning. We're thank, thank continuing you. this meeting to continue the 25th of October. To October 25th. Yes. Sam, second. Jana. All those in favor? Quick discussion. Yes. Just, I want to suggest to the board members, I had a chance to do this, to go up and down South Street and look at the variety of, of buildings on South Street. I know Ravel is one certain area and Olive, but there's other kinds of massing of buildings. There's apartment buildings made out of brick. There's Smith College and their large buildings. So South Street is a, a mixture of neighborhoods and um, so, and, and, I, and I think it, t it helped me to look at some of those other buildings closely. The one across the street, the old vet building, mm -hmm. is going to be a different kind of look and massing also. So yeah. um, it's not all single and 
um, two family homes. So, Agreed. so everybody has a chance to go down here and take a look at that. Before right. um, well, we have a vote today. So, those well, in favor of can continuing? You from South Street coming in from East Hampton, it's across the street, which makes it look not so large. Can you do it right from that side of the street so you see it when you're coming in? So, 244 South Street. Stand in front of my house and look right at it. We have, a, we have a motion on the table, so we're going to vote to continue this hearing to October 25th All those in, at 7 p.m. All those in favor? Yeah. Anyone opposed? Because this meeting, uh, this hearing is continued, um, you will be able to have another opportunity to come back. The hearing remains open. Um, in the interim period of time, we are, those of us on the board are not um, able to discuss this project with any of you outside of the context of the public hearing. So if you run into us in the grocery store, we won't be able to talk about this project. Uh, if you have folks who are going to come to the next October 25th meeting, please watch the video to look at what has already been discussed. And we'll see you back next month. Thank you. Thank you. I was glad you sent the email. We should. Thank you. Because my understanding is different. I don't think that's going to have any discussion. Isn't helpful. And we have another hearing, folks. So if you are here for the 7 40 p.m., we can get started in a moment. But it's, it's open for any law. So I think yeah. it's not for the parents. I think it's a so state it's law. Right. It's one of the typical <laughs> actions of life. We're talking about the open yeah. meeting law. Yeah. 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 anyone at the grocery store? Yeah. Oh, well, what George was saying George about our store. ability to, like, to talk to each no. other. No talk. No talk. Yeah. Yeah. Not much talk. I mean, yeah. yeah. We should not be having, like, we should not be having any discussion that would contribute to our deliberative process outside of the public hearing. Anything, you know, so if you I think at some point when the hearings shut it down, we're not always at hearings, we have a little conversation about this, you know, going to site plan visits together, sites together and talking about with the maps and I think that's the question. I, you know, people expect to know what's what is like in our decision. So yeah. like right. on the end of, other end of the spectrum to a site visit together and then you say, oh, you know, my brother wants to bid on the paving for this project, yeah. we should, you know, that would be completely inappropriate. So yeah, so it's just yeah. limiting yep. any discussion. Yep. Yes. Thank you for your patience with our delayed hearing for you. Um, we are ready for the 7.40 p.m. hearing, uh, which is a special permit and major site plan for Sincarfa Solar LLC for construction of a large-scale ground mount solar array on the north side of Park Hill Road in Florence, map ID 49-12. Is there a presentation from the applicant? There is. Is this, uh, so we had sent a PowerPoint today. Did, that, did you get that? Um, we, we have it on a thumb drive. It's okay, okay if we just. You can just plug it into there. That's fine. I thought that was the only thing that I saw to download. So. It was a, it was like a, an 80 megabyte file. It was crazy large. So I oh, I did. Actually, yeah. I think it's on the thumb drive because I did download it. Okay. Um, I just maybe pulled up the wrong file. Is the thumb drive still on there? I'll just take ours. It's on the flash drive if you go click to the left. See the um, D? Yeah, right there. Is it on there? Oh, there it is. Right. Any more presentation? PowerPoint. Beautiful. Perfect. Good job, Carolyn. So <laughs> while I'm waiting for that to load, um, my name is Todd Morey. I'm with Beals Associates. Um, we're the we're, we're land planners and civil engineers. Um, with me this evening is Devin Howe from our office, Carter McCann from Sincarfa, and Abby Pyrus from Sincarfa as well. Um, so we're here to talk about a uh, solar project out on Park Hill Road. Um, I, don't, I don't know how familiar you all familiar all of you are with the site, um, but it's in the kind of southwest section of Northampton, corner of Northampton. Um, I guess it's technically in Florence, and it's on Park Hill Road. So Park Hill Road really has two paved sections. One comes in from the from the west off of Glendale, and one comes in from the east, um, and they both kind of end, the pavement sections end, and then it turns into a very narrow uh, dirt gravel road. Where we're proposing the site is on that dirt gravel road section. So it's about a 37 and a half acre 
parcel of land. Uh, it's, to the north of it is the old Northampton landfill. There's um, been some solar added to that. And short, uh, short distance to the south is the East Hampton city line. Um, and you can see actually on this graphic, there's, there's also uh, on Oliver Street, there is a solar facility down there as well. The zoning for this parcel is, uh, there's actually two zones that show up on your maps. WSP is the majority of the parcel. There's also a, um, an SC zone that's really centered on Hannum Brook as it flows down through. So on this graphic here, Hannum Brook kind of, that mouse up in there, Hannum Brook kind of follows this, uh, this green strip as it comes down through, and then it turns and, and flows to the south off the site and underneath uh, Park Hill Road through an existing culvert. A little bit more zoomed into the site. Um, we have gone out and we delineated bordering vegetated wetlands out there. Uh, there's a riverfront, a 200 foot riverfront area that's associated with Hannon Brook. Uh, we presented earlier this evening to the Conservation Commission and we were approved um, uh, about, an hour, about an hour and a half ago now. Um, so we, we did get our order of conditions from them. Also this afternoon, uh, the city engineer signed off on the stormwater permit, so we do have that from DPW. I believe that was emailed uh, to you this afternoon. I think you got it about the same time we did. So there were some conditions on there, but um, nothing too, too onerous. Uh, and also, uh, earlier today, I saw the, um, uh, the other public works comments. I think you forwarded them to me earlier today. And again, there was nothing on there that we, we see as problematic or that you want to um, complain about or anything like that. So. Uh, as you can see, the site is really kind of split by, by Hannenbrook, that whole piece of land. Um, as I mentioned, it's about a 37 and a half acre parcel. And what we really want, uh, we're really only planning on doing solar on the open meadow area that you, that you can see in this photo. So early on, in, the pro on this, in this process, when we were working with city staff, uh, you know, they, they came up with the idea of, well, why don't you subdivide part of it out and, and donate it to the city? <coughs> So what we're going to end up doing is really cutting this into four pieces. So in the western, the, the tail, if you, if you think of it that way, based on the shape of it, there's going to be two parcels. Both are around 2.8 acres. Really no plans with anything to do there. We, Sincarfa doesn't, they're not home builders, they, they, they're solar developers. So there's no plans for that. The middle portion, which is really most of the colored area on here, as well as the north, uh, the north portion up near the, the old landfill, um, that would be no donated to the city of Northampton. And then the remainder of it would be developed for the solar project, which I'll show you in just a moment. So this is, this is where we ended up with the final plan. So the original plan that we submitted with our first application was slightly different. The, the, the whole facility itself was moved just slightly to the northwest. We had a little bit more riverfront area um, encroachment. And down in the southeast corner, kind of down here, uh, there, was a, there was a kind of a bump out where there were some more trees. Our original intent was, if, you, if we go back there, on this photo you can see there's that stand of trees kind of in the middle of the site. Um, our original intent was to make it so that was, that was the only trees we were going to cut. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't going to cut any other trees. So if you go out on that piece of land today and you look around the field, there's a, there's, there's a great wooded perimeter around the entire thing. Um, when we had a, a meeting with some of the neighborhood abutters, um, and as, when we've met other people out on there, we've been able to point that out and just say, as you stand here and you look at this big perimeter of trees, we're not cutting any of that down. Everything we're doing is in the meadow. So we tried to keep it in that central portion. Um, in order to uh, get through the order of conditions process, we also had to compile an alternatives analysis. A lot of the times when we do the alternatives analysis, uh, nothing changes coming out of it. In this instance, it did. We found a different alternative that was less environmentally damaging. Um, unfortunately, what that meant is that this, I'll get over there, hold on. This portion of um, trees down in that corner uh, ended up coming out. So it, it just about doubled the amount of trees that we're cutting. So um, while I'm talking about trees, so you have, there are two things that are in your zoning that are specific to trees that pertain to this project. So the first one is this project is only allowed in this zone if I'm cutting less than 25,000 board feet of timber, which sounds like a tremendous amount. But when you actually start adding it up, it's not all that much. So we're cutting about 60 to 65,000 square feet of trees. We're cutting 24,000 24,600 and something uh, board feet. So we are almost at that 25,000 board feet. It doesn't take much to get there. Um, but we are under it. 
So, so we, we satisfy that. The other uh, zoning issue that you have, the zoning um, criteria that you have with regards to trees, especially on a site like this, is you have a significant tree ordinance and bylaw. So what that says is that any tree over 20 inches, we have to replace um, with, a, with half of that uh, equal caliper, with a minimum of two inch uh, caliper. All total, we're, do, we're cutting 32 of those size trees down. Um, and we end up replanting 169 two and a half inch caliper trees. So I'll get to the site plans, I'm gonna show where all of those are uh, in just a moment. Um, it's just a little bit more on the zoning uh, requirements. So front yard, we're required to have a 50 foot setback. We have 53, and these are all to the nearest panel, um, these, these measurements. Rear yard, 50 feet, we're gonna be 57 after we, we subdivide that, uh, that parcel. And on the side, we have to be 50, we're 53 right now. And then below here was just a summary of what I just told you about the trees. So our, our general site layout plan shows a, a few things uh, that I wanna point out to you. First of all, the, the, all the trees that I, that I just mentioned. So we have a very heavy concentration of them. Um, in the north and northeast portion of the site. And that's really where the majority of those trees are gonna be planted. Um, a lot of that is in the riverfront, uh, planting native species of trees within uh, um, resource areas is exempt from the Wetlands Protection Act. So, um, so we're gonna convert that area from the existing meadow uh, to, a, to a wooded area. Um, the trees that we're planting up there are a mix of white oak, northern red oak, American linden, and honey locust. They're all hardwoods, and that's, that's what we're planning. The other thing uh, that I'd like to point out on this plan is how our access comes in. So we're coming in on Park Hill Road. Um, the road itself right now is only about 8 to 10 feet, um, and it's, it's in fairly rough condition. Uh, I wouldn't recommend driving a car through there frequently. Um, if you've got a four-wheel drive, that you can get through, but you'll scratch the sides of it, especially as you come in from the west off of the end of Park Hill Road. We worked with um, city staff quite a bit to come up with an idea of what to do with that road. The initial recommendation was, well, it's a public road, so you've got to improve, improve it to public standards. Um, and I don't, I, I haven't really talked to anybody who wanted to see a 26 or 24 or 26 foot paved road on that end. So what we ended up doing and, and, and talking with it, and, and it worked through with DPW as well, um, was to basically just uh, re-gravel that existing road section 12 feet wide, and that'll allow us to get construction vehicles in there um, while we're building this facility. Once that, once construction is done, we would stop trimming, stop maintaining, and just let it kind of go back to what it is today. It's, it's fairly grown in. Um, it's not a, a big thoroughfare. I don't think too, too many people would want to use it as a cut through. I know a lot of people walk on it, and it's probably better suited for that. Um, once we get onto the site, there's going to be an 18 foot maintenance road that goes on there. Uh, that'll be constructed out of gravel. Um, and it, it only comes onto that site, that little short bit, and goes up in between uh, those two major sections of panels. The purpose for that road really is just to allow the, the periodic maintenance trucks to get in there. Um, if they've got to go service the transformers, which are these gray boxes up on this end, um, we, we've, we've got enough of a road to get them up there. They can turn around in this little turnaround area and get back out. The trucks that usually go in there are pickup trucks or utility vans. Uh, these are not very, you know, these are not tractor trailer trucks that go in there, um, not large equipment uh, vehicles at all. The other thing that this site plan shows, uh, in addition to our proposed panel layout, um, uh, we, have a, we have a switch pad right here, and we also have battery storage, uh, which is a, a fairly new technology with, um, with, with these solar developments. Uh, we're just starting to see a lot of them have it. It's a uh, lithium ion series of batteries. And really the purpose for them is to, uh, you know, when, when the grid is kind of maxed out, the overall electrical grid is kind of maxed out, and this is still generating power, it's a place for the power to go and be stored. When the grid uh, is demanding more, then we can, we can discharge into that. So it's, it's really a, a way to maximize the efficiency. Of this. Um, in addition, we, we, we've shown we come off that switch pad, uh, we run underground, we to three, we're showing three poles right now on this uh, site plan. Um, and those are all on the property. From there we run underground, down Park Hill Road, 
to the last power pole. And if you're familiar with that area, there's two houses at the end of the paved road. On the right, there's a power pole right in between those two houses. And that's where the underground would rise up on a riser to, to connect the grid. From there, National Grid would- So I'm, I'm sorry, could you back up one? Where are the three new poles going? Um, right. Along your service road? Along our service road, on, on the property. And then you're going underground from your service road to the last pole Correct. by that residence? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in the uh, Park Hill Road right away, that would be underground. Um, one of the unique features to these types of projects is that if you have the right site, so to speak, um, and the, that site has the right grades and, and, and everything, you, you really don't have to do any earthwork, um, any significant earthwork. Um, we're very fortunate. This is a, the majority of this site is a meadow, an existing meadow. Um, the way these uh, systems are installed on the ground is they're constructed on large tables. The tables result in the panels sitting about, at the low end, about three to four feet high, and at the high end, eight or 10 or 12 feet high, and they're, they're tilted, of course. The panels are secured to the ground with one of two methods <clears throat> that we use for this. Either a push pole, um, or, you know, a push pile that's just pushed down into the ground about four feet, or in case we hit uh, rocky soil and, and with a lot of cobbles and a lot of boulders, um, we'll actually use an earth screw. Um, and, you know, and I, I sometimes describe these as helical augers, and if, um, if you've seen heavy construction, you can have these helical augers that are four feet. These aren't what I'm talking about. The earth screws are about this big around. Um, Everything else around that is not disturbed. So once we put these tables in, the grass under there remains, the grass around it remains. Um, this, in effect, remains a meadow with a, with a series of panels just sticking up on it. The other thing that you used to see a lot of is uh, on, on these sites that have solar, um, they, used to, they used to have to be flat. They, they really don't anymore. So these tables can actually support solar installations up to a three to one grade. Um, we don't get quite that steep anywhere on this site. Uh, but we do get up, we're probably about somewhere between four and five to one, um, especially in this, I lost the house again, there it is, in this central area where we're, where we're cutting those trees down. Um, we're right around four or five to one. So we do get a little steep there, but we don't intend to grade it. The minimal grading that we're doing on this site is over on the southeast corner, you can see on that drawing, uh, there's a little bit of uh, a diversion berm that we're putting in, and that's really to help with some of the storm water. So when we go from a wooded situation to a meadow situation, it increase your, increases your amount of runoff. So we had to deal with that um, and, and just kind of slow it down and let it, let it redistribute through the meadow. Um, and then, of course, along the, uh, along the gravel road, we're doing some minimal grading as well. This, I'm not sure why we put this drawing in. This was just some of the erosion sediment controls that we, uh, that we included in the plan set. So that's the project. Um, can you answer one very quick question just absolutely. to go back to trees? Um, sure. Can you just say again the total number of inches that are being cleared that are coming down? Uh, used for your 547 placement? inches in that central area and 294 inches in the southeast. So you, I think you mentioned the total number of trees you're planning to plant m yes. may have been different than what was in the application. Can you clarify what that number what is? It's 169. 169. So it's, it's higher than the original application because when we moved the whole system down to the southeast a little bit, right. as a result and of And that, that still represents 50% of the, the total inches that are coming down? It does. Yeah. So the central area, the 547, mm -hmm. I've got a, I'm looking at 110 trees to offset that. These are two and a half inch caliper trees. Um, and the other side is 294 was what we're cutting. And I'm doing 59 two and a half inch caliper trees. So just on that line, with all due respect to the applicants, how do we corroborate those numbers? Does an arborist, does somebody give you data that shows? Yeah, that? they're supposed to show the total number of trees counted and tabulated. Um, I didn't see the total count. I mean, I saw the total count but not um, in a, you know, uh, identification of, of species. Yeah. But um, yes, the applicant's supposed to present that number. Okay. Yeah, I, I, is this something like? Yes. Great. Yep. Hey, hey, how much is this? Don't get it too much trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So this is the, um, these are the significant trees, and then the second two pages are the, uh, um, the board foot calculation. And the board foot calculation, we counted, we didn't count just the significant trees, we counted everything uh, 12 inches in bigger. So the so but in terms of um, making sure that the, they're planted on the back you know on the back end, I would certainly recommend a condition um, that prior to final sign off show that they've met the requirements in the ordinance based on the number of trees that they were. Yeah. And, and if it helps, also um, we just committed to doing an as built for our certificate of compliance with conservation commission that has to show 169 healthy trees back there. So. Um, those will be on an as built somewhere that the city will get. But if, if you know if you want to echo, echo that condition, that's absolutely. Um, apologies if you said this earlier, but can you just um, either say again or say for the first time, uh, what is the total construction period? What's the duration of construction? It's, it's about six months. So um, what we're hoping to do is start right around the um, mid to late November time frame, and then it would go six months from there. We had, um, just as a reminder to the board, but also to the public, we did have comments submitted on behalf of the city councilor, you know, in this ward who is supportive of the project, um, but who did also mention that, you know, there had been some concerns from some neighbors about the scope of construction and what that yeah. would look like. And so um, it's helpful to know, yeah, that this is a, a fairly quick, quick project. Yeah, back in, in um, I believe it was in June. Mm -hmm. So June, we had that meeting? Yeah. There's, um, we invited an awful lot of people from the Glendale Road area, mm -hmm. everybody on Park Hill Road, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the surrounding area, yeah. um, just to just have a meeting on the site. And we all met on the site, mm -hmm. um, the people that showed up. And there, that was one of the main topics was the construction. Um, a lot of it was, gee, I can't walk through this field anymore. Um, what will we do? What are you doing about wildlife? But construction was a huge one. So um, we had another. Uh, Actually, unless there are other technical questions from the board, there are a couple of other folks from the public here. So if anyone objects, could we take some comments from the, great. So we'll take some comments from the public and then probably have some more questions for you. Sure. So if anyone would like to get up and make a comment or a statement, please don't be shy. Uh, someone's gotta go first. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, Mark Sternick and I am, I am the owner of, oh, actually if we could, Get uh, one of the things back with the properties. Uh, There's one that had all the properties. Right. Yeah. That oh, one's that, good. One? that one or the second one? Uh, that one you just had was fine. No. Um, so I have uh, the. Is there it is. I have the piece that is very odd shaped. It's got this acre back here and an 18 foot wide by 750 foot long piece <laughs> wow. to the other piece here, which I also own. And I intend to be building there uh, this coming year. Um, I actually purchased this property when I heard that the dump would become a solar farm. Yeah. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not at all against having this. Uh, I am a little upset that um, I love the view from back here in the woods, looking over the stone wall across this lovely meadow to the mountains to the west, which is going to be not so much meadow, but uh, Solar panels, but I am also happy to see more solar panels. Um, I do have some questions for these guys. Um, could you just let me know the size of the battery storage that's going with this? Um, do the transformers create sound and what decibel level? Um, the height of the array. You, uh, you had mentioned that it varies from like five to 12 feet. Is that correct? It's about three feet, three to four feet on the lower end of the till, and eight or 10 or 12 feet on the upper end of the till. So up so to the panel. 12, the panels will be up to 12 feet tall. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, basically, I would ask that um, if we 
we could go to the planting, yeah, the planting plan. So up in here, this is really the only area that affects me. And again, that was my view over to the mountains. So I am concerned about the trees and the size of what you're planting there, but I would be open to working with the group to kind of meet out on site at some point prior to them doing this uh, and just working out where I'd like to maintain a view and where I'm okay with planting trees. Um, Is that something that would be amenable to you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and then also the type of trees too, of you know, ones that won't grow 80 feet. Yeah, and and as long as it doesn't violate the the order of conditions. So for example, right. we can't we can't move any panels, which you probably don't want us to move any panels to the northeast. So there's that uh, river no, front area. So, no, I do not. But but if there's if there's a certain gap that you'd like us to leave in those trees, right, and focus and them elsewhere, we can do that. Yes. Right, that's so, what I'd like to talk about. So I'd like to ask that that be included in the condition as well as something in the condition uh, and it, it could be very kind of open but uh, something about how long do you already have something about how long those trees need to be healthy is it a one year That's two year so yeah well our, our zoning already prescribes um, you know prescribes that and anything that's in the in the planting plan right. you know will be kind of checked on and um yeah so i don't know that we can condition yeah. a requirement that there be coordination between you and the developer um right. i don't, no, I, don't know I would just ask that that yeah. be the case um if you can't include it in that condition yeah, as far as the health of the tree goes um we got a three-year time frame for conservation okay and that's that's fine. My only other issue is um, I don't think that this will affect drainage on my property, but uh, I do have on the road where my property meets the road, there are drainage issues with a culvert that's kind of broken and in pieces and not in good working order. And I don't know if that's just a completely separate thing, or if if I could ask that as a part of this, that in case there might be any drainage issues uh, increased from this property, that you know right. my hundred feet or whatever along the road be repaired. Yeah. So part of our stormwater requirements, if a stormwater permit is issued by our DPW, it means that the applicant has successfully calculated that there won't be any additional. Um, runoff from the site so there won't be anything anything different from what had previously uh, occurred and so you know once our DPW reviews that and issues the stormwater permit then you know that's what we go by certainly throughout town there are other drainage issues in other places um, that are not you know what we can't do is require an applicant to address something that isn't related to her his development and so uh, the issuance of the stormwater permit you know, kind of says sends us the message that they've adequately dealt with drainage on and the site. And has that permit already been issued? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Oh well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> drainage kind of flows the opposite way. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I forget I forget Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's it. Anyone else? Um, my name's uh, Christopher Fees. I'm uh, a butter. Um, let me go back a couple pages. Uh, there's a uh, okay. banner up there. Right, go the other way. Okay. Let's see. I'm at the uh, 981. I'm on the west side of the uh, the lot. So right I'm, uh, I'm that little house way over here on the left, right there. Um, it's a very popular house in the city of Northampton. It's had its history. Um, I like the fact that they're that they're doing the uh, the solar panels in an area that's an open meadow. It's not really going to change the landscape. You know, unfortunately, the view of it. But it's not. They're not digging up everything. They're not changing a whole lot of it. They're planting more trees than are there, which is fantastic. Um, my major concern was these two lots that they have um, off to the west here. Uh, they're donating the area in the middle, the Hannah Brook, and the extended areas for the rot uh, water runoff to the Northampton um, Conservation Commission, which is great, and it leaves these two lots. Now, I haven't been there for too long, but 
I've seen everything, deer, bear, squirrels, chipmunks, I mean, big, small, everything in between running through there. I certainly don't want any of that to change. I want to keep those animals there. It's their, it's their land. We're borrowing it. Um, and I'm really hoping, my, my major thing is that nothing else happens other than what they're projecting. They have no future plans. We, you know, they've, they've told us that. No plans to develop the area. They're not home builders. They're, they're solar guys. So basically, I'm just hoping that, um, you know, there might be a stipulation or something saying, hey, let's try to conserve a little bit more land. Let's see if we can get these other two 2.8 area uh, parcels or acre parcels to be donated or some kind of stipulation for non-development or, or something, basically, to keep it kind of the way it is, you know, let's keep it more wooded areas. And that's, um, that's what we have sense. Thank you. Thank you. I can start. Hi. Hi. I'm Jennifer Lerner. Um, it's actually in my house. I am right here. The last so, house on the... The last house on the right? No, on the third, am I not? Directly opposite the two lots that my neighbor was just referring to. Um, my picture window looks at those two lots. So I also would like to say, please, 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 this neighborhood took it on the chin 50 years ago when we said, please don't make us live next to a dump. But we lived next to the dump, we handled it. You know what we handled. Um, this is a great project, and I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, but it's a lot, it's a good use for this location. It, a, there is an incredible amount of wildlife here. There are owls that use those two lots. There's two fox families that, that's what you're gonna encounter when you take out the, um, the middle, mostly pines there. That's, there's a den in there. Really? Be kind. Yeah. Um, it's probably some survived hugging the trees in there to get the measurements. <laughs> so I guess that's, I guess to reiterate what my neighbor is saying, um, we've really, wanted to live in a rural part of town. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, I, I'm for solar, but look at what's happening. It's shrinking, it's shrinking, shrinking. I really don't want the only wildlife corridor to be left to be Park Hill Road. Um, so where those two lots now, where, where the project people don't have any current use for it, that's not sort of what they do. I'd hate to see them sold off for lots. Um, it's contiguous to the existing um, open space that the town has already owns and um, which with what's being donated. I'm not speaking clearly, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. No, it's fine. On TV. Ah. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I would like to speak on behalf of those two lots. My picture window looks out on it. We used to look at cows on those two lots, really? which was awesome until um, his cows drank from the now poison brook because of the leachate from the dump. So those cows had to be pulled so that his cows could be healthy and, and give healthy milk. Um, so I, I, I guess what I'm saying, and at the same time that that happened, we went from having wells on our road to, oh, hey, hi, town water for you guys, which we now have to pay for, but at least it's healthy. So when I say we've taken it on the chin for decades for Northampton, we really have. Um, I, in discussions with these folks, they seem at least at this point in time to be amenable to putting some kind of restriction on those two lots. Um, those are the two lots that affect, well, all of the abutters, essentially, except this poor gentleman on the other side who's getting a nice view, I guess, now at this point. So if you can see your way somewhere um, in making recommendations to other boards or whoever, what other powers that, that be, if you could just grant our neighborhood some aspect of rural life and just let us die in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The other concern really, which we've already discussed and they've been amenable to, is just protecting the trees along Park Hill Road. I've got a big hickory out front that was just recently trimmed. It's a beautiful tree. We'd like to keep it. It's, as you know, a very narrow road. There's a single lane there. If you're going to need something, you know, getting trucks in and out of there, take from that empty space if you have to take it all and, and wrap the trees up and down that road if need be. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, it's my understanding that we don't have the legal authority to prevent development on those lots. Right. I think it's important that you both brought it up, you know, while the, the applicant is here, because there are some, you know, some other mechanisms, but, you know, unfortunately, we aren't legally able to, you know, correct, is that right? But yeah, let me just explain a little bit of the background of this parcel. Um, so this was in what's called Chapter 61. Mm -hmm. 
land which gives a tax protection for the property owner um, as long as they keep it in agriculture but the stipulation is if they want, want to take it out of agriculture then the city has the first right of refusal on the land um, and then the property owner has to pay back taxes um, on the land as though it was developed for the previous I think it's three years um, so what we've negotiated with the property owner through this um, project is that area that is along the you know the resource area that's important for wildlife and um, conservation for the city is to protect that 14 acres that's that in the colored area that's Hannon Brook and the buffer essentially not as much of the colored area shown a little bit smaller. Um, so that was part of the negotiation to instead of having the city exercise the first right of refusal mm -hmm. that that that's why the uh, the owner and the applicant are dedicating that piece to the city um so because that's the crucial portion of that um habitat that we we're really interested in so um the other piece to um know is that officially the front um the road, the improved Park Hill Road extension, ends at that last house that's on the southern side of Park Hill Road. So um, this solar field will not have legal frontage, ev even though they're going to be laying down a portion that will um, be improved enough for them to get vehicles there. It will not um, make that um, a developable parcel in the future. So if the panels came off, um, it still would not be a developable parcel because it doesn't have official subdivision way or frontage. Um, so they'll need to maintain access for themselves and DPW made comments about, you know, making sure that they're responsible for snow plowing even though it's in the right of way that it's not the city responsibility because it's not an accept, it's not an improved way road so what that means is everything else that's west of the colored area the conservation area is still remaining um, portion of the property that has legal frontage so having legal frontage on the west end means um, under state statute um, that um, anyone can come forward if they have legal frontage on an existing way that's been accepted by the city can um, carve off or create development lots if they meet the standard frontage requirements so um, they have proposed they've shown two 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 point eight or lots as um, and they've we also have an A&R that you'll be looking at um, tonight as well for that that doesn't mean they'll necessarily sell those off but what it means is when you have legal frontage there's nothing that the board can do to prevent um, development of lots that meet the minimum standards under um, subdivision law so <clears throat> if I may um, I'm Carter McCann from St. Carfa um, <coughs> first I'll start by answering a couple of all the questions that came up um, the battery size out there is going to be a two megawatt battery with four megawatt hours of storage. Um, so you can pump energy out for two hours. Um, transformer noise came up. Um, the transformer is sound about the same as a window air conditioning unit. So when you're standing next to it, it's about that hum. When you get 50 feet away, you really can't hear it. Um, do so know, do you know a decibel level? I think they're about 50. 50 when you're right on them, um, and then again, as you get away at the property boundary, you, you cannot hear them at all. Okay. Um, and at night, there's zero. And at night, there's zero. Great point because mm -hmm. nothing's happening, so nothing's buzzing. Um, Fox Den, that's a new one, Sorry, but we'll talk to no, that's good. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to the construction guys and figure out the best way to get them out before we go in there and awesome. take all the trees down. Um, and then last. I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but just in terms of timing. Um, we've been expecting this program to come out for the last three or four months. Um, and when it comes out, there's a five day window to apply to the program. And you need your interconnection agreement, which we have, all of your permits, this would be one of them. Um, and we got conservation earlier. So this is really the last, I'll call it pillar 
um, to approve the project. And because it came out yesterday, they could release it Monday. And then we'd have five days to apply to get into the program. And if we miss it, there's a chance that we don't have a project at all. Because people have been developing for the last two years, building up pipelines, and the program just hasn't been open. So day one, it could fill up and kaput no more. Um, so having said all that, and then with these two lots, we met with some of the abutters beforehand, and I, I did call my boss um, just to talk to him about it. If we can close tonight, and I know that's you know there's more discussion to be had, we're willing to put those into conservation um, and potentially donate them to the town. We haven't gotten that far yet, but we could lock them off. Nothing would ever happen on them. In addition to the stream, Thank so you. Thank you very much. you're welcome. Any other comments from the public? Uh, um, is the road, Parkville Road, in that section officially discontinued now? Or is it something that could potentially ever be re... Like, can Park Hill Road ever officially connect and be paved? Um, <laughs> so it's not discontinued. It's still a way, but it's an unimproved way. So therefore, it doesn't count for subdivision frontage. The goal would be to create it as a, a trail and bike connection, not a road, not an improved road to make, but make an improved pass transportation connection, but not for um, up to the standards of a subdivision road that would then create frontage. Uh, yeah, my, my intention was not to get this to be paved, and then uh, I think we're in uh, we're in connection here about like we'd love to have that be a trail and have it be, whether it be discontinued or be created as some kind of bike trail or hiking trail, whatever. Wait, I have a question about that. <laughs> when you say you mean improved in some way to be part of a trail system? Yeah, yeah, as a bike as part of the bike network. <laughs> well, to attach to what? To connect to the I'm other sorry. end of oh, Park Hill. I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, where, where would it be going? Just the other Park Hill. Where's the connected so, so um, looking at the entire city, we have a transportation plan to connect, you know, not, uh, by, so non-vehicular access from neighborhoods that are not connected through sidewalks and bike paths so there's a trail coming from you know almost from there's a there was a subdivision that was approved several years ago off of drury lane that has a connection a trail connection that then comes through where the previous development that was that had been kensington estates um, is open space now and so that would be you could connect then from those neighborhoods or the wet you know West Hampton area through the city open space across Glendale Road and then drop down and connect on Park Hill Road um, up to Florence Road so that's sort of the southern connection for bicycles are there plans somewhere for that that we can do? only in concept yeah, I mean, I think Carolyn's just saying that that's, that would be a potential option, but that's not something that's in development or on the table yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah, it's just, you know. Not, there's nothing in design, but the idea is, is a long-range plan. Is that the kind of plan. thing that abutters would be notified? Oh, sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, long-range concept planning for how we connect all pieces of the city in a way other than just on the street now. It's a single, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's a single lane road, so a bicycle an occasional bicycle right now we have yeah. many bicycles someone's going to be hurt you're not, you're not going to see many bicycles going down that road. don't worry well, if you can well, if you, well but that's, if you and that's why you make it nice and and attract people to a specific solar tourism is that our new uh, I think there's a lot of bikers here that that's our new thing be happy so back to this project yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so I, comment, George. just to stay on that discontinued road i think the larger issue would be the landowner to the south side is that sunny breaky who owns those fields yeah yes that 
he wouldn't have access to that property or an ability to develop that right at some point if it stayed discontinued. Is that that it's discontinued? It's yeah. unimproved, so unimproved. it doesn't count as a subdivision yeah. road. So no, there's no frontage there for any of those parcels, right. including this solar field. Yeah. yeah. Um, one more technical question. There was a reference in the application to the chain link fence that goes around the parcel, and George, you had raised this as well, um, and that's listed as a seven-foot fence, but that has a gap at the bottom for wildlife. Can you just say what size that gap is and if it has to be seven feet tall, if that's for security or it, it's just it a actually, big... It has to be that tall. Okay. Um, National Electric Code uh, makes us do that. So okay. anytime you have those kind of facilities, that's the size it's going to be. The gap is a six-inch gap, and, and it's really to allow wildlife to get back and forth. Um, you're not going to get a bear or a right. deer running through. Tiny little, but, but bear the bear small will jump. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and when the bear decides to get in, he'll get in. But that's that's the gap. So just to stay on that, could the fencing just be around the transformers and the batteries and the service road rather no. than the whole perimeter? It has to be around the whole perimeter. Um, Is that because there's zoning two around the solar fields or. It's not a zoning issue. It's their um, the requirements. Yeah. Oh. So really. Yeah, it, there's there's inverters on the back of each um, set of uh, each table, yep. each set of panels. So there's there's electrical equipment all in there. So anytime you have that electrical equipment, you have to have that perimeter security fence. And the perimeter fence, which I didn't notice on any of your plans, is that does that follow the actual property line? No. Nope. Nope. Let me show you. Does it just follow the panels? It does. Just outside of them. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I can get the mouse to be here. There we go. Try this. Try this. So, okay. yeah. is it, so is Bounce that a, a fence line, line, line or a setback line, line that I'm looking at about 20 or 40 feet point back point from point the point property line? Point oh, this computer's tired tonight. Come on. There we go. The, so the, the fence is, we, we try to keep it about 12 feet off the panels, and that's it. Right. Um, we, we don't need any more room than that. And the reason for the 12 feet is that just allows us to get a mower in there. Or if something happens to one of those panels up by the fence, yeah. worst comes to worst, we can get a pickup truck next to it and drive right up to it. Um, so on this, you kind of see a dashed, a dashed line yeah. that follows pretty close to the panels. That's the fence line. So oh yeah, I see where your problem is. Um, yeah. So the, that 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 line right there. Okay, that's, that's not working. That's the first line. I'm sorry. Which? Want to do it again? Yeah. Yes. I was trying to use that. Um, this that right right there. And so right uh, at my view will be this. Be you're more, more of that. Yeah, you're above it. Yeah. Well, I know I'm above it, but I'll just be looking. If you if you look back down towards it, you'll you'll see yeah. it. Uh, and that's something when we talk about the screening. Yeah. Um, we can plant trees. Just to stay on fences, so currently almost the whole perimeter is lined by a barbed wire and an old metal fence, which doesn't probably belong to you. But are you going to remove that, say, along the road when you install the new seven-foot fence? No, we'd like to not do anything along the road. Uh, we don't want to cut any trees. We don't want to get in there and pull any old barbed wire fence out. So where, where our fence line will be will actually be about 50 feet into the property. So if you walk down um, that portion of Park Hill Road today, there, there's a lot of pretty large trees right off the edge of that, that dirt road. Um, we intend to keep all those there. And then, you know, there's, there's a pretty good upgrowth of some brush and an understory. So we want to keep that in there. Any other comments from the board? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so we have an interesting decommissioning plan for a big installation like this or any big building in town, right? Where you accept the surety from the developers. Mm -hmm. And they laid out the decommissioning, how much time it takes to truck things out and what. But it doesn't list anything for decommissioning the batteries. And I imagine they're somewhat of a hazardous waste. So that would be good so again our worst fear is that the the company goes away they go defunct the city is kept has to clean up the site so sure so the batteries are actually pretty easy to get in and out because it's in it's fully containerized so it looks like a shipping container on a tractor trailer truck so it'll be delivered in that that's fully sealed and then within that container the batteries themselves are fully sealed 
So if you do get something happening on the internal, you have the external chamber to catch any of that. Um, so it'll come in in that, and then 30 years down the road, it'll go out in that as well. Just put it on a truck and, and pull it away. Wouldn't there be a huge cost, though, to the shipper or wherever you're going to deliver that battery to that somebody has to carry? It, because it's a hazardous material. There might be, and the, but the other thing that we're going to do with these batteries is we might replace them after 10, 15 years because mm -hmm. um, they do degrade, but then there is some value to that degraded battery. Um, so we might, similar to the solar, um, we might get scrap value for it, but yes, I mean, we have to pull it off. Um, we don't think it'll be completely useless because yeah. otherwise we would have gotten out of there earlier. So I, I just don't know if that's a reasonable amount of money for the city to hold for this decommissioning. But if you feel like all those costs are covered, then how is that so number? The amount is 36,000. Right. Well, it was in the application, so they showed the breakdown of the cost with, um, you know, um, um, like basically amortized for future year costs. Labor to dismantle the array, yeah. um, trucking to move it out of there. Um, the two big costs, I think, it's on page 25 of their report. So I'm, I'm just a little bit nervous about because of all that we hear about hazardous waste, and yeah. nobody wants to accept it um, anywhere that the city doesn't get. Right. So labor, trucking, and grading. Labor, trucking, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I don't. Um, I don't know what that um, number <coughs> would be. You could add a 10% contingency if you felt like it needed to be on there. So I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps the applicants would know better because they're in that industry. But again, it's all kind of projections of down the road 15 or 20 years. But yeah, um, does, does DPW, who validates the that number? Um, I don't think DPW looked at this number per se. I mean, they didn't make a comment, I guess I should say. So they may have looked at it. Um, I think, um, so I think we've just, certainly I took it as face value and said, okay, this is what they're representing. Um, but if, um, you know, I could ask them directly before the, you know, so the, my recommendation for a condition is, you know, prior to, start of construction that they post this bond, mm -hmm. there's still time within that period to have, um, make sure if DPW does know anything about that, if they can make comment. Um, uh, do we have to, do we have to include the dollar value in that condition? You don't have to include the dollar value. The other thing you could do is just like in the subdivision approval that they have to, um, that the board has to approve the final number before they, submit it so we, they could come back with that number um, and then you could have a more detailed discussion if there's if for, for example if DPW has um, um, has a different idea about what maybe re, um, mm -hmm. recycling costs might be or, or we, something we could condition it so they don't have to come back so you know right. condition <laughs> uh, the bond uh, Condition on approval by DPW without without a dollar amount or no? You can't. What you can do is without a dollar amount that you could say that you you want to approve the final amount. It doesn't necessarily have to be a um, it, it doesn't have to be an amendment to the permit, but it can just come back as a regular item on the agenda before they start pulling permits and for you to do the final you sign off on the number. You have to sign off on a building permit anyway. Um, the the board doesn't the but I mean, you're, right right you're the city yeah, does yeah. so yes yeah, so, so that's it would be prior to issuance of the building permit they have to come back and with a final dollar amount that the board approves so you could I, just make the condition that they have to post the bond with a final number to be approved by the board mm -hmm. so it's not an amendment you just it just the number gets submitted just like a performance guarantee for subdivisions you guys look at that outside of public hearings so it's not. That's that all makes sense, but if thirty-six thousand dollars, we can't get our arms around that today. They come back in two weeks and say, "Okay, here it is again," and it's yeah. thirty-six or thirty-seven five. We're not going to be any closer to knowing then as we are now. 
But what I'm saying, suggesting is I could go back and pointedly ask DPW if they know anything about those numbers and it, and the applicant in the meantime could also look up if there's something about batteries or, or some, just yeah. to have a little bit more information yeah. about that. DPW yeah. may know from their own solar array right. up that right. dump, you know, but it's probably different batteries. That was done five, six. I still want to know. Even know probably don't even have batteries. Yeah, yeah. batteries. yeah this, the batteries is a pretty new technology. Is it? And the East Hampton landfill just south of you doesn't have batteries um, either? Probably not, because it's under this new program that I described I see. earlier. I see. Okay. So, yeah. the first so we're open to this, this you know, figuing out the number. Great. So It'd be helpful. I just don't want to make it unnecessarily yeah. no, cumbersome for a project yeah. that everybody seems yeah. okay with. Right. Good. But if they don't have to come back. Right. right. Mm -hmm. That should be good. Um, I mean, you could also approve the number which submitted as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any other technical comments or questions for the applicant? One real quick one. Yep. So I, I think you mentioned there was not going to be a lot of grading there, though the topography is certainly rolling, mm -hmm. um, especially moving up towards the abutters place outside of that copse of trees. Right. Um, but and maybe this was a condition of the conscom. Are you going to do reseeding of the meadow? Um, because certainly underneath all these solar arrays a lot of grasses can grow there's still a lot of wildlife birds butterflies whatever so is part of the thing to to reseed or to rejuvenate so the meadow itself we won't reseed we'll just allow that existing meadow grass to keep growing yeah. right and we did hear um actually we heard from this lady here um that, that field hasn't been mowed in about 20 years mm -hmm. so um that encourages us because that's even less maintenance so that's one thing you, you always look for is low growing less maintenance. The areas where we're removing trees, those areas we will have to seed. Um, and we had a we originally had a seed mix proposed in the uh, um, in the plan set, mm -hmm. um, and we were requested to change that to something that we could get from New England wetland seed mix. They don't have just wetland seeds; they they also have uh, meadow mixes and, and various wildflower things and things like that. So um, we actually are specking a meadow mix from that company on a large project that we're doing with these folks in Northbridge, Massachusetts. So uh, we're familiar with that product and we don't have a problem with it. Like, you don't want to condition like a wildflower mix. <laughs> 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 they have these wildflower mixes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on the right I, site, they actually grow nice. <laughs> on, on some sites, they I certainly would because on the other side, we're doing a lot of negative impact to the wildlife. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was interesting. I drove around the East Hampton solar array, and they have a lot of wildflowers that do just grow up naturally right. underneath at them to the sides. And so I'd love to see them do pollinators all across there. Half yeah. of Northampton would jump up and applaud us, but uh, I think that'd be going too far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carolyn, were there any other questions? Yes. So um, I mentioned the one um, they want to see final construction plans 15 days prior to issuance of a building permit. Um, and again, sort of the, the, the applicant would be responsible for maintaining the um, improved um, portion of the road in terms of grading and plowing, snow plowing. Um, and uh, they also asked um, that the underground electrical conduit um, wire be included in the decommissioning um, aspects um, of the plan. Um, it was a 36,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What did you say the other number was? 37,500? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, that the um, sub base for the improved portion of the um, dry, the road in the Park Hill Road layout um, have a sub base of um, eight inches of gravel burrow meeting DOT standards and um, a gravel surface. Um, meeting uh, basically meeting subdivision rules and DOT standards and I sent the details to the applicant so they know that um, oh and one more other item they wanted to um, for their construction entrance um, they want an eight inch minimum um, construction entrance de depth for the um, stone at the construction entrance just during construction or 
Um, well, because that's the access to the site. So. Yeah. Um, Do you have any questions about that? No. Okay. We might hear a motion. Yes. Well, it, just one more. I just wanted to confirm there's no lighting at all on this part. So at night, if your technician comes out to look at something, he's wearing a headlamp. He's, he's got a headlight or he's got a handheld kind okay. of thing. Or he's not going at night because he can't fix anything in there. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> All right. All right. Um, do Which is probably the more likely answer. Do we want to have a condition about, you know, there will be zero decibels at the boundary lines? That's in the code. Like you can't That's have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Motion to close public comment. Second. Sam. All those in favor? You want to close? Any other discussion? So the road improvement is monitored by DPW. They're right there with them, pretty much. No, they just need to sh they, they show the construction plans and then they build it and then they have to maintain it. Okay. This is so only going to be used by them. Okay. But there's that crucial culvert there, right up from the houses. Um, Just because Hannah Brook does have that history, you know, mm -hmm. so we're all kind of concerned that it doesn't get impacted negatively even more. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that would be a building department complaint, right, or something? Or well, not for the road. That would go right. to DPW. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Maybe there's a motion. I don't have an agenda, George. So you're up. <laughs> I've got one here somewhere. Mark. <laughs> you to recap the conditions. Make a motion uh, to approve special permit for site plan major uh, Sincarfa, is that how you pronounce it? Sincarfa Solar LLC for construction of a large scale ground mount solar array in the north side of Park Hill Road, Florence Map ID 49 12, with the conditions noted. Great, Mark. Second? Second. Krista? All those in favor? Yeah. Those opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We have a little bit of business, so feel free to chit chat among yourselves outside or <laughs> quietly in here. Um, free A and R. So, um, first one. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So it has 175 feet of frontage. It's two lots of room. Um, they're just shown here as 2.8 acre parcels here on Park Road. That's them. Looks from yeah. You say Is there a motion? Parcels and your rents. Can you tell if we're talking about an A&R? Okay. What's your question? What happened with those? I'm not clear what happened with those parcels and what just happened here. I'm sure. But they right. volunteered to okay. yeah. donate right. it. Okay. And there wouldn't oh. right there would so be. So this right here is just shows the plan. They've already submitted the A&R plans, not because they were planning on selling them but because they oh. just wanted folks to we have a bit of business that we still need to figure out on, on our end so thank you so much um so they submitted this officially to create those parcels basically what happens is if they don't do anything with them they just sit on the record as parcels and they get taxed as <laughs> building lots and that's it so um that's what the, so the ANR was submitted so you all have to there's 21 days that you're obligated to act once an ANR is submitted or else um, um, it's um, they get to do whatever they want with it like if you don't say yay or nay then it becomes then it's by default they get um, approved so they're showing me um, two lots that are meeting the frontage requirements so, so if we 
don't do anything, the approval not required is approved. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, basically, you have to file. The person would have yes. to file with a clerk to yeah. say um, that they're so constructively granted. But don't we want them to file with the clerk that they have deeded these as conservation land? You can't do that. We can't it's require it. Yeah, no, no, we said they would. I know we can't right. do that, but isn't that the end game? We want them to do something official to say that they're giving it over to the city, just like they offered here? Yeah, I mean, that's a separate, that's outside of your uh, approval for that permit for the solar array. Right. You may want that individually. Some of the board members may want that, but it doesn't have any bearing on whether they, you sign off and endorse this as not being a subdivision plan. So even if you sign this, even if you said, yes, you agree this isn't a subdivision plan, which it's not, doesn't mean that they still can't pursue permanently protecting these right. these right. parcels in some way, shape, or form. Right. But if, if we deny them the ANR. You can't deny them the ANR. Because you're denying the endorsement of the ANR says that this requires a subdivision approval. And it doesn't because it has frontage on a street. That's the only purpose for approval not required. You're just saying, that's right, these lots have frontage on a street. And if they ever wanted to build a subdivision there, they would have to come with subdivision plans. Right. right. Which they don't have any intention of doing. Right. Right. So I'm all for approving the ANR, but just informally, who's going to continue to work with the developer around the conservation restriction? Nobody. It's their offer. They're, it's yeah. a side yeah. conversation. Yeah. If they do want to do that, they'll just either come to the city or maybe they'll go to the property owners and they could even or they could even the report trust, a conservation right? restriction. Really like the land trust and do a CR on it, right? And still own it? Um, if they wanted to? Yes. They could put a CR on it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So whatever their mechanism they decide to pursue is outside of the uh, jurisdiction of the board. So right now we're looking for a motion to endorse. Or a motion to endorse the AR. Sam, is there a second? Second. Janet, those in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. Second one? Uh, second one is um, Crescent Street. Um, so this is a uh, parcel that um, has a house on Crescent Street. Oh, wait, let me find. Oh, yeah, Crescent Street. There's a property here that fronts on Crescent Street, but it's sort of L-shaped, and it wraps around to Round Hill Road. This portion of the property has never been used, really. So there's a garage back here and access to this house from up Round Hill Road. So they want to create a 5,000-square-foot parcel. This is an... Um, urban residential uh, B district. I'm sorry, C. So 50 feet of frontage, they're showing 58 feet of frontage. So that's a developable lot. Yeah. What's that little building on that other parcel? That's a house, that little, that perfect square? A butter's garage. Oh. <laughs> garage on Crescent Street, house, and yeah. somewhere else. <laughs> so this is infill. This is infill, yeah. So was the other thing that you saw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> motion oh, to motion endorse. endorse Anybody? This, Mark, uh, second. Yeah. Krista. It is Krista, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> this moment that I feel like. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. My name Terry. <laughs> <All in favor. laughs> okay. So the last. No. The last one is um, a D plot on Bridge Street. I don't know what the best way to show this. Bridge Street here. Amherst that way downtown this way um, Hubbard so these are two parts uh, these were two parcels now but um, the line is the existing line is right here this person wants to carve off a lot here for another house but um, it needs to meet a 20-foot setback um, so they wanted to readjust the line this way um, the architect came up with an idea of making a curved line here wow. just to bubble around this little corner of the garage. 
Yes, it will make it quite complicated in the years to come to know where the property line is. But at any rate, there's um, 66 feet of frontage on, on Hubbard. Um, and actually, the frontage really doesn't go, you know, they have to have, they need 50 feet, so we'd really count it here because 66 Can't doesn't that go straight me. back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is urban residential B, and it's a 5,000 square foot lot. And no, and no one knows where the property lines in that neighborhood are anyway, so makes sense. <laughs> Perfect. Well, but when you do a brand new survey and you set pins, <laughs> then you'll know. <laughs> so, Carolyn, in situations like this where it's in a neighborhood with a lot of abutters, mm -hmm. do abutters get notified about these A and R's? No, um, no, they're posted on the agenda, but no, we don't send out notice for. Because um, it's and. not. Because you're just endorsing the fact that there is a piece of land that has adequate frontage to meet the subdivision rules. So there's nothing being proposed to be built. Right. Um, and if they did do something that triggered site plan, then a better notice would go out. Motion to endorse this a &R. Second? Yeah. Yuri? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? <laughs> I miss you. We just don't always want everything to be unanimous. True enough. I, that's not true enough. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Is that right? An A and R, really? That's what it's about. Yeah. Line in the sand? An A and R? It's an easy one. Oh, it's a line. It's wow. a weird line. Oh. Do you need a minute? No, we don't have a minute. I don't have a minute. So there's another wonderful motion that could be made then. Motion to adjourn. Motion to reject George's. <laughs> 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 Sam, are you the second on the motion to adjourn? All those in favor? <laughs> Remember, our South Street hearing is still open until the 25th of October. Please.